It's time for Push to Play, your weekly trophy podcast with Mindy and CJ. Welcome and thank you for joining us for episode 21 of Push to Plat. Oh, it feels like deja vu this morning. I hope you're wonderful listeners, whether you be first time voyager or return journeyman. Now, my co-host, how are you today, Mimi? I'm good, I'm good. How are you? No, no, no German horse joke this time around. Are we done with that? Well, look, we're done with it until I get to my German horse riding uh, adventure. So I, d- I don't know when that will be. I mean, would you like to speculate a guess when that could be? Uh, you know, two weeks after never. Yeah, that's right. That's I will right, say exactly. if you if you are dropping it in a bid for me to drop my uh, my two questions I asked just to piss you off, that's not going to happen. Actually, mm-hmm. I know I know Cornshack will have a lot to say about one of the questions, but we'll uh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Oh, but I've spoiled I've spoiled the guest. Oh, I screwed up your no, that's, your introduction. That's okay. Look, why don't we just jump straight in, listen? We're very privileged again to have a wonderful guest join us today. Mr. Cornshack, YouTuber, reviewer extraordinaire. How are you today, sir? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me on. Not at all. Thank you. Now, we're just going to abbreviate your name to Corn today, listeners, if that's okay. It just makes it easier for all of us. But that's the person we're talking to. We haven't changed anything. And, of course, you can find him on YouTube under Corn Shack, which we'll refer to later in the show. But, look, to start us off, Mr. Corn, would you like to just tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, I've been gaming my entire life since I was able to hold a controller. My parents were really into the Nintendo Entertainment System, so they played it a lot, and then thus, newborn baby, they're like, here, here's a controller, it's funny to watch him play. However, they created a lifelong love of video games right then and there, and uh, I've been on YouTube now for 11 years, I started in 2007, I've just recently hit 30,000 subscribers. It's one of those things. I'm a unsung hero of YouTube, or I, I, I don't, I'm not one of the big flashy ones. I'm not going to get into the drama. I'm not looking for, I'm not doing a whole ton of collabs and all. I just kind of do what I do. And uh, I love it. I love doing YouTube and I've been loving it for, since I started. Excellent. So, so that's the professional core. Now I'm always interested in the, the person. So why don't we, why don't you tell us a little the, bit? The corn, the corn after dark, if you will. Oh, you're, you're, you're... Uh, I don't know if we can get into all that. <laughs> well, look, it's very, it's very, it's very painless. I'm told. Yeah. You won't even feel it. So uh, okay. <laughs> no, what kind of <laughs> genre do you like to play? Obviously you play, you play a, you know, a stack of indie games. Is there a particular genre within these games that you like? I think uh, where I'm best, it's kind of like funny. It's like, what do I like to play and what am I best at? And then kind of like what I actually really enjoy when I think about it. It's like, so I love platformers. I've always loved 2D platformers, uh, Super Mario, and then once Mario 64, 3D platformers. So I feel like that's my wheelhouse as far as I play hundreds. I mean, hundreds of platformers. So if there's any genre that I think I can review better than any, I would say it's probably the 2D or 3D platformer. But as far as what I love to play and what I consistently play, it's funny because I do all these games and I'm playing all these new games all the time. So I'm bombarded with all kinds of different genres. I can go from a racing game to an RPG to, you know, first person shooter, whatever. I, um, I consistently like to, at the end of the day, relax to my simulation games. I play a lot of The Sims 4. I play a lot of SimCity. Uh, and I play a lot of text-based simulator games. Uh, I like ones based on, I play Out of the Park Baseball, which is a baseball tech simulator. Doesn't sound that exciting. It really isn't, but I'm kind of into that. And I also play one for professional wrestling and a few others. So that's kind of like what I really like to do when it's like end of the day, enjoy some you know nice tea and just relax. It's, that's what I go to. Tech simulators. Yeah, that's a, that's a new one to me. I, uh, I, I'll i tell you, I was a Sim Ant girl myself. I love Sim Ant. Love right? Sim Ant. Right? So you're you you do a, a lot of genres. I'm gonna I'm gonna sneak in my my first question here. 
how about metroidvanias <laughs> love them um and that kind of put that almost a little bit with the 2d platformers to a degree if they're a 2d metroidvania of course because mm. uh, it's kind of like the evolution of platformers and combine rpg elements and you know all these things and then we got the metroidvania and uh i think that yeah that'd be probably second especially lately because it's just the great metroidvanias whether it be super metroid or symphony of the night or what have you have inspired so many in the modern generation of game developers that we're seeing so many indie projects based on metroidvanias so i love the genre and i can keep playing metroidvanias till the day i die however i could understand why at the same time some people are probably getting sick of seeing that in like the indie scene yeah no i love metroidvanias just just a sidebar this conversation seeing that metroidvania has now become an inside running joke for the listeners of this podcast can i just thank dat one seagull last week for sending me a thesis on what a metroidvania is <laughs> no joke this is like six pages of oh, what wow. it is and like yeah, look i read it it was fascinating and you know i thought i had a handle on what a metroidvania was and then last week listeners as you remember we had Macca on and he threw out that ori and the blind forest is also a metroidvania i, I don't know are you familiar with this game corn uh, at all it's an xbox is it a metroidvania ori and the blind forest is a great game I, I mean it has metroidvania elements yeah for sure it's kind of a genre that also because elements of it sneak into other things and just uh making games more elaborate adding more details to a game potentially if you're just doing a simple 2d platformer adding a little bit of a maze element that you have to backtrack through all of a sudden it's a metroidvania instead of just being a 2d platformer at least in some people's eyes so a lot of ways it's this kind of evolution of games how do i make this indie game even better okay cool 2d platforming cool attacking action stuff now let me throw in some mazes maps and some special items that you have to get and then backtrack mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it's a lot meatier of a of a game and a, of, a, of a product but does not necessarily metroidvania make but it is kind of becoming this umbrella no. term right it, no, I, I totally agree with that. And I, I mean, I, so there was a Kotaku article a few weeks ago, and I, I don't pay attention a lot to the news of, like, you know, the, the sites. I just look at, like, the headlines, and I'm reading articles wherever I come from, and then I kind of, like, do my own research to figure out, okay, you know, whatever with sites. So I don't have really a preferred video game news source by any means. But I did see that Kotaku article where it was like, stop calling things Metroidvanias. And it's like, if it's things of Metroidvania, that's what it is. That's the genre that we've created and this term that we've created. It's kind of like um, per, like um, the first person narrative game is a walking sim. But we've now walking, everyone pretty much knows the term walking simulator, whereas maybe not as many people know first person narrative. So I think if it's Metroidvania, it's just a genre and that a lot of people want to throw everything in it because it's easy and convenient when you see one element of it and like, oh, it has that. It must be a Metroidvania. So Mindy, are you going to ask the follow-up question? I I am. Okay. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Korn mostly now does reviews for, for games that come out, mostly PlayStation games that have come out. But uh, I've known about Korn for several years, and he started out, uh, his goal was to play every, correct if I'm wrong, every NES game that has ever come out? Correct. Yeah, I, the, the North American released NES titles. At least that was my initial goal. Um, I wanted to do at least a video covering every one of these games, and that's still my goal. Uh, I've been doing it 11 years, so it's, it's slowed down a lot. And I started to run out of, like the real bigger bigger nes titles like the real popular ones the ones that people want to see so i immediately started branching off into snes and sega genesis and i've because of that i've kind of gotten sidetracked over the years from the nes i don't focus on it quite as much uh but yeah no that's my still my goal i want to at least do a video because some games it's hard to play through no one's going to sit in there and watch me play an entire uh season of bases loaded four it's just not something someone wants to do and nor should they have to and nor do i feel like really doing it but i could do like a little mini review of the game and thus that would satisfy my thing of doing a video for every game so do you have a running tally right now of what you've done versus what's left yeah <sighs> no sadly um I, it's one of those things you could ask me a title and i'm like yeah i've definitely done that one but i uh it's one of those, uh, definitely something i need to do for sure and that way i kind of have like an idea of how daunting of a task do i still have ahead of me but uh i don't plan on slowing down or stopping the videos it's just uh they take a lot of effort there's retro walkthroughs i do the play it through series so i just don't have as much time and it's harder and harder some games are just really difficult to actually beat in an efficient manner without dying a lot or other things mm -hmm. 
So this and this is just gonna this is mostly just to annoy CJ. But every <laughs> every uh is it March? You play four Mega Man games. Oh, no. I, I used to. It, it's 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 unfortunately I haven't been able to keep up. And this year was like the first year ever I didn't get a Mega Man video up. Not that I didn't try. I was working on a few ROM hack videos, like because I've run out of like the major Mega Man titles. So I'm doing like, okay, what else can I do Mega Man related? So I was looking at ROM hacks. So I was like Rock Man, no consistency and stuff like that. And uh I was doing well, but I just never got a run that I was in love with or thought that was up to my standards, so I didn't get the video out. But yeah, for many years, for like 10 years straight, I released four video playthroughs of Mega Man titles in the month of March. Oh, CJ, what do you think about that? It's finally happened. I knew this day was going to come. You have <laughs> snuck a Metroidvania master onto this show. And now he also plays Mega Man. You knew this, didn't you? You I knew did. this going I did know this. Yes. I'm sorry, <laughs> She set me up a beauty. She knows that I'm a massive Mega Man fan, as the listeners know. So I didn't know that oh, that's about awesome. you. Yes, it really, it really is something I can tell you. Awesome is not the word I would use. No, but anyway, look, let's let's move along before I find out something else that I'm <laughs> trapped in here. Uh, and I have a question for this week. I'm going to get my revenge here, I think. So I have been playing, listeners, a lot of the new Assassin's Creed uh, Odyssey. Well, I suppose it's not that new anymore. And this term comes up a lot in the game. Maybe I've just become attuned to it. And then I, I, I came up or I found this question. So I thought this would be this would be good considering it considering the caliber of our guest and co-host uh, today. So the question is, and it's not gaming related, so prepare yourself. Would you rather have a golden voice or a silver tongue? Would you rather have a golden voice or a silver tongue? Who wants to kick us off? Uh, I'm silver tongue for sure. I'm much more. I've always, uh, one of my favorite things in any game uh, is the ability to convince people through the dialogue choices to give me what I want without doing anything. Uh, <laughs> I love Bioware's games, uh, the KOTOR games, for example. I even got stuck in one of the KOTORs, KOTOR, uh, KOTOR 2. Get my words out there. Um, but uh, Knights of the Old Republic 2, uh, there was a thing with uh, Aradian, and I ended up causing him to kill himself too many times with the Force powers that it ended up like glitching, and I couldn't get through a locked door that he was blocking <laughs> but yeah no silver tongue all the way i love convincing and yeah, anytime i play a d20 game i always do a charisma based character yeah yeah i like that i think i think i'm much the same as well i think the way assassins uses it is very light on uh that term but i think i think in reality in real life influencing people when they don't realize you're influencing yeah. them or persuading them to do what you want it's just it's just one of life's little joys isn't it for the educated i think but yeah but look you know as far as a golden voice i mean who wouldn't want that i'm sure that would be fantastic as well but look i'm not blessed with that so you know we we make do with what we can mindy do you have anything you want to throw in there yeah, it it depends. If will I know my future? So if I I I, I want to <laughs> for, for those reasons actually want would tend towards uh, silver tongue, but mm. would I know the outcome of my golden voice? So are we talking golden voice mm. like I can I can bank on it for the rest of my life like the movie trailer voice guy, <laughs> or is it a I golden so. voice? Or is it a golden voice like the chocolate rain guy where people know who I am for like 20 minutes, but that's not like a, you know, like flash in the pan versus consistent income. Mm -hmm. Well, see, I think that's taking it to a deeper, deeper level, isn't it? Yeah. Well, like silver tongue would be very useful in politics, you know? Very true. Yeah. Do I have political aspirations or am I, am I in sales or am I just like you know a construction worker who just happens to have a silver tongue or a golden voice you know it's true. this is what i do i i overthink things <laughs> i sort of think that the golden voice it's like the superficial outside layer you know when you see someone you go oh look they're attractive they have a golden voice but you know what's going to keep you warm at night what's going to get you going when you're older is that that silver tongue that pointed wit and comments so i i don't know i think i think i think maybe there's more merit in the latter rather than the I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, listeners, you can you can think about that. You know, you know. And look, look, I did well again. We 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 threw in a question that has nothing to do with games. Fantastic. Uh, so so speaking of games, why don't we move on to to what we've been playing this week? And Corn, what have you what have you been playing this week? Uh, this week is not been a whole whole lot uh it's been kind of a slow july's like notoriously slow because everyone's kind of like oh let's get ready for the holidays you know all that kind of stuff so i've been mostly playing 
just indie titles. The Stranger Things game, I'm still playing through it, Stranger Things 3, because uh, I'm going for the Platinum Trophy in it. And I have to do the New Game Plus, which is like a survival mode as well. But I'm doing it on the hard difficulty to make myself, you know, just give myself that little extra whatever. So that's... Oh, that's going to be that's gonna be brutal at the tail end. Of yeah, it. it's been fun so far. I'm about... I'm over halfway through. I'm in uh, episode six. So I got a little bit more to go. That final thing, though, I can only imagine how tough it's going to be trying to keep people survived. I have everyone still alive at this point, though. I mean, it's not it's not hard to keep people alive. You just don't press continue. It doesn't auto save when you die. <laughs> Correct, but I'm playing it like Fire Emblem style, where I don't reset. If I die, I'm like I'm gonna keep going. I, I make games harder than they need to be for myself. I really do. But I think that was growing up with like playing the same game over and over again. I just would make okay. What happens if I play this game but I don't use this special ability this time and try to make it even harder for myself? Wow, <laughs> it's like one hand behind the back method. I like it. <laughs> yeah yeah well mindy was a i i love doing that kind yeah, of stuff mindy actually wrote a guide for that game so she's quite uh she's quite uh quite knowledgeable on that one yeah that's oh that's awesome yeah i know i loved it i really did enjoy it i thought they did a great job with it yeah i liked it a lot i i, I liked the season you know the the show better but i thought oh i i, I well, yeah of course i, I think i call fantastic. it a pretty solid mm, seven maybe eight out of ten like pretty I gave it an eight because I thought it was just a good app because it's an adaptation kind of thing that I thought they did a great job with it while still being fun, the retro feel. So I and I love Stranger Things, so it was like eight, but yeah, seven. Probably if it didn't have Stranger Things on it, a seven yeah. would have probably been what I ended up giving it. It kind of made me want to play Zombies Ate My Neighbors, even though it's not really that com- comparable. It's got enough of a feel that I'm like, oh, I should find my cartridge again and play it. Which version's your preferred, SNES or Genesis? SNES. Yeah, that's usually the choice, but some would only know the Genesis one exists, but yeah. I I do own the Genesis one. I just, I you know, the SNES one was what I played back in the day, of and course. it's yeah. my preferred one. I did the, um, I did 100% run of that game. Uh, that's the hardest video I've ever done, without a doubt. All survivors, every level. It's near impossible, and it took me over a year of practice to finally get a run that was, I mean, I did thousands of attempts, <laughs> but uh, it's such a good game. Oh, God. I can't imagine, man. Like, wow. The problem is, um, if for those who've played Zombies Ate My Neighbors, the later levels, uh, the neighbors, you get the werewolf neighbors that automatically transform after a certain number of seconds on the map. So you have to hightail it to certain spots within the very few, first few seconds of a level and get to certain survivors or else they're gone and you lose them permanently if uh, a civilian turns themselves into a werewolf. And it's the kind of, like, I can't, as much as I would love it to get ported onto modern consoles, I really don't, because I know the trophy list would have stuff like that. And Zombies Ate My Neighbors is the kind of game where there's a password system, but it doesn't save your inventory. So the passwords are useless, and you really do just have to play it in one sitting, right? Yeah, that's how I've always done it. I I had, as a kid, I had so many saves for later, but I would try and just get bombarded. Like, the, the levels would overrun you with so many tough enemies there's no way without extreme luck you're gonna have the firepower to take out heavier monsters in that game i just hope if they ever did a remaster or remake in any way that they do make that tad bit more accessible we don't need to lose all our stuff at save points you know you can still be every four levels but at least let me keep my stuff yeah that that was the main deal breaker i think was correct without a doubt but i think one of the issues would have been and because they didn't want to put a memory backup in if they were going to do that they would have had to have a really long password and we know how bad those were on the nes where you just have so many letters and lowercase uppercase i think that would be because that would be what you would have to put in for the hex code or whatever they would kind of be like oh here's your game and here's all your items I don't know, Mega Man, the, the X series seemed to do okay with just nine pictures. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's true for most of it, but it's still not as, I think, I don't know, maybe it'd be with the number of variables and stuff, I don't know, maybe it'd be harder. I have no idea. I'm not a programmer by any means. Listeners, Push to Plat is becoming a retro games podcast. <laughs> I, just, I was just about to say that, yeah. Yeah, look, that, that's, that's fantastic, yeah. Is, is there anything from this, uh, this you know, um, century that you've played? Yeah. Um, uh, Else uh, I, I Well, this week I just played Blazing Chrome, which just came out this week, but it's a Contra clone oh. from the Super, the Super Nintendo era, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I also played Agawas uh, last week, which was a uh, kind of an inspire from Wonder Boy on the Sega Master System, so there you go, even more retro yeah. there. Well, it sounds like you've been busy, but we're going to get more into that in the, uh, in the topic. So, Mindy, what have, uh, what have you been playing this week? Well, I'm almost at 500 Platinums. I'm at 498. So this week was mostly wow. mostly spam. 
just to get that count up. Um, I did play. What did I play last week? I talked about strange. Oh, Emerald Shores. I finished. I finished that that run. Oh, <laughs> that sounds oh. pain. I definitely, I definitely played that game the wrong way. So bad. Um, oh. So if anyone's thinking about playing it, first of all, don't. But <laughs> secondly, uh, if you do decide to go for it, your first run definitely make it your low level playthrough. On the regular mode, and then play remix mode and get as high a level as you can. I think that'll make it easier for you. This was that was the cross-platform title, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's the one I played on Vita, and it had terrible, terrible controls. Mm, that's right. It was oh so the oh. jumping and everything is so bad. That game, all oh, it's indescribably bad. Like it was, I was hard to come up with words to describe how bad the controls were in my review. The controls are really bad. It you know the controls were were not tight. They were loose. It, there was. <laughs> And I feel uh, bad because it's this game is clearly someone's labor of love. Like this guy who, and I think it's a one person team, like one or two people. Yeah, they clearly so. love these old kind of 2D platformers. It's just, this one's not very good. You know, midway through the game, you spawn this super boss just for no reason. That, that, that's, that was really cool. <laughs> honestly the super boss yeah. is easier than the final boss of the game but we won't talk about that uh, yeah because you can like bounce on its head or whatever it was yeah. it's, it's hysterical <laughs> what else have i played i played uh cj you and velvet broke me down and i played figment and it was charming and i liked it a lot yeah it is nice isn't it it's sort of relaxing yeah. in a way and i think everyone well, yeah relaxing until you know the checkpoint system gets questionable and then it gets a little annoying oh okay <laughs> just in like boss battles yes yeah yeah. I, I kind of was wondering if this game would be better without the combat, and I was like, I don't, I don't know. Mm. I really don't. Mm. Mm. Um, and then I played. I don't know if I talked about this on the podcast. I played uh, Dragon Sinker. No. Which is one of those Chemco RPGs. So oh. one of those, you know, shorter, little shorter, like 15, 20 hours to platinum. But it's a, you know, sixteen bit rpg that i did not at all play efficiently so it took me a lot longer to platinum it than uh than it should have once you do one of those chemco though like they're almost all the same so like you <laughs> they're so yeah. similar to one another yeah yeah well it just makes me want it makes me really want and i wish they wouldn't for a minute it looked like they're going to put all those old uh squaresoft rpgs on on Sony, you know, when Chrono Trigger came out on Steam, I was like, oh, it's going to come out on PS4. I noticed because that was the trend with like Final Fantasy 7 and 8 and 9. Like they got remastered and put out on Steam and then it came out on PS, you know, consoles Yep. Uh, a couple months later. So I was like, oh, Chrono Trigger is going to come out. And then it didn't. And I was really, really bummed about that. Yeah, especially after they fixed the, the Steam version because it launched the Steam version was not a mess people exaggerated how bad it really was but i understood their complaints um mm -hmm. but once it got fixed that little bit it would have been fine on ps4 and i'm honestly surprised they haven't but then again i wouldn't be surprised if we still don't see it in the near future before ps4 is done yeah i just it just it bumps me out but also i i kind of want them to update the achievement because the achievement list was tragic on on yeah. uh on the PC release. I was like, come on, man. Like there's so many cool achievements you could put in this game and you're not doing any of them. Like, I don't think there's even an achievement for getting all the endings. I'm not sure. I, it, it's like, I think a lot of them, I think, but I'm not sure. Honestly, I would have to look back at it, but yeah, no, I remember the achievement list not being anything exciting. I get disappointed so much now with these games with uh, them and um, Konami, especially it seems like every, or uh, Capcom, sorry, not Konami, Capcom, all their re-releases, like the trophy lists are awful. So awful. There was one I really liked, and it was the it was the uh, X collection. I was like, "Yes, you guys had yes. you had fun with this list. That's fantastic." That one was decent. It's no, it's another Mega Man game, CJ. By the way, uh, yes, yes, yeah. No, no, I'm still alive, <laughs> listen. I'm still breathing. <laughs> I can I can hear your teeth grinding. No, no, not at all, not at all. Yeah. So, w would you recommend this Dragon Sinker? If you if you like. 16-bit like retro jrpgs and i mean not the kind that are like a throwback to them but the kinds that actually came out in the mid 90s with all those same story tropes yeah i would recommend this one if you don't like those kind of this will change your mind okay that seems good is this a i see this is ps4 beta is this a this is just one stack isn't it it's one stack but it is cross cross by i don't think there's 
cross save. Okay, so it's one. So or the you other. gotta you, you gotta pick one. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. They're funny because most of the Chemco stuff that's coming is actually cross buy between Vita and uh, PS4. But the recent one, uh, the Bonds of Sky, I think it was, was sold separately. I'm sure that was Chemco as well. I'm not sure why that is. That was hmm. a little disappointing because I know that As Divine Dios uh, too recently was as well uh, cross buy. So yeah, look, there are, there are a stack of them, aren't they? They just uh, they appear every couple of weeks. Yep. Maybe I should play one eventually. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you're almost at 500, but you didn't say what 500 would be. I see two candidates there. Have you decided? Or uh, There are two candidates. Uh, I will not talk about them right now because okay, that's all right. we are recording another podcast in a couple of days and I need something to talk about. <laughs> but I will no, say okay. neither, of those, neither of those candidates are going to be Platinum 500. I'm hoping to make oh, it. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I'm hoping to make it Castlevania Requiem, but I just got to get through Rondo of Blood. I'm not doing well at Rondo of Blood. I'm really not. Corn, did you do a video on Rondo of Blood? Uh, sadly, I didn't get a chance to play that last collection. I have it, um, but I bought it like three weeks after it came out, so it was like, do I yeah. bother doing the review? But no, I haven't had a chance to trophy hunt Rondo, but I do plan to. Did you do it, but did you do like a play it through of Rondo of Blood? Not yet. I played through it many times. I did a charity marathon for Castlevania years ago where we like played through all of them in 72 hours. And mm-hmm. I did it, I did it then. Um with I did all the endings and everything. But it's been a few it's been a few years since I had like mastered the game. Well I played it uh, a couple months ago or whatever it was when it came out. I was not doing very well at the beginning. <laughs> I have to relearn Richter. Like it's kind of a, a relearning thing with controls. Yeah, I I I'm most Castlevania games, I'm I'm pretty good. Rondo, I'm struggling with, and I think it might be because I just never played it when I was. That's a big thing with it. Nostalgia does a lot. They'll go back, especially muscle memory. You just played so many games so many times. It's like you play them now, yeah, and you still exactly. remember it. But yeah. exactly. So I'm I'm hoping it'll be Castlevania Requiem because I very much want what is a man a miserable little pile of secrets <laughs> uh, to be a milestone. What a great name. Trophy? Yep. But it all depends on if I can get through Rondo, really. It, it actually just struck me, listen, as I realized we didn't ask when we were talking, uh, we were finding out about Corn. We didn't ask what type of trophy hunter he is. Are you a, are you a, oh, we didn't. I know, it's tragic, oh, isn't it? Bad. Are you, are you, what would you classify yourself, Corn? Are you a completionist? Are you a, like a, somewhere in between? Does that not interest you at all? What do you, what type of? I mean, I, I used to be really, really into trophy hunting, and I have 240 platinum or something like that right now. And I I slowed down massively because I was just getting bombarded with these extremely easy plats that just made it not – like, to me, it just made it less fun. Not that I care if they exist. I really don't. But it's like, to me, it wasn't quite as fun. And yeah, I got another platinum in a Retallica game or whatever. You know, whatever. I, pronounce their name wrong the game company every week they're releasing indie games that are extremely easy platinums and sometimes you is another company that consistently is releasing these easy plat games so now with trophy hunting i do it slower but i'm now going for the games that take longer and are more meteor 100 percent completions like assassin's creed series i want to get every plat in that i have every plat in the far cry series um, and I actually want to redo Bioshock 2 and, and Infinite soon, but I want to do like those kind of harder things for my plats now instead of just the easy ones, but I still take the easy ones, of course, when I get them without any effort. Like, you beat eight levels of a game that's 30 levels long, and you get a platinum, it's like, <laughs> yay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's devaluing the hobby, perhaps, I see. Yeah, okay, cool. Well, I'm glad we I'm glad we covered that that area. Is there any other games you want to, sorry to, to interrupt there, Mindy, was there any other games you wanted to, to mention there this week? Uh, no, that's that's pretty much it. Perfect. Well, listeners, you know, I think I've played a stack this week, but I've made very little progress across anything, I think. And the, going with the trend today of just talking about games that have nothing to do with current current releases and things I, or, or the system, I'm gonna, my first game I'm going to throw out is uh, Florence. So this is unfortunately not on the PlayStation for some, uh, some reason. So this was, I think, a year or two ago. This would be on PC. Uh, I played it on um, iOS on an iPad. Uh, so, so there's multiple places you can play it. I imagine you've possibly played this corn no not this one i have not oh you haven't oh i would recommend it look it's only a couple of dollars on um on ipad it's uh published by annapurna interactive so i'm looking you know, at it everything now they touch. Yeah. yeah everything they touch is those usually are, those decent. are the uh those are the uh edith finch guys right 
the publisher behind Edith Finch, yeah, not not the not the dev, but yeah, Anna, um, Anna yeah, that's right, yeah, and they do they do a lot of fantastic stuff. So this is, I mean, look, it's it, it's a it's a very short experience. You take you less than an hour, I think, or whatever else. It has a wonderful soundtrack and just the just a narrative story of a uh, of a young lady, I suppose we could say, a young lady, and just sort of a passage, you know, a rite of passage through life, uh, the early stages of adult life, or whatever else, and relationships, and it's really lovely, and it's it's sort of like a I, I suppose a small proof of concept in a way that. There's, you know, each chapter is a, a couple of minutes long or whatever else divided up into to five acts. And uh, and they just have different gameplay elements. It could be like there's a, some little jigsaw puzzle parts or some, you know, like uh, etching on the screen, if you like, drawing uh, or moving things around. It's very, very simplistic, but it's a really beautiful little little story. So if you're, if you're looking for a break from the, the trophies or something else, that could be, it's just a lovely little thing to do. And I'm, <clears throat> I've actually never really played games on iPad myself before, but I'm, I'm sort of... I'm sort of uh, finding that there's actually quite a lot of good stuff there. So I, I had a recommendation, listeners, for this To the Moon. I don't know if, if anyone has heard this uh, of this game. It's sort of an adventure. I know that. I've played To the Moon. Yeah, I hear it's supposed to be quite good. I don't know. Would you, would you agree or would you disagree? <laughs> Generally, yes. I think it's a little overrated, okay. but I still think it's worth a playthrough. Yeah, well, I read they're actually making it's going to be a series. So I think the next one is out, or it's it's that there's going to be multiple sort of I don't know if they're slightly standalone or, or how they link, but sequels or whatever else. So look, you know that that's the next one that I'm gonna gonna start in my endeavor to expand myself from the the PlayStation ecosystem. But look, let's come back to some PlayStation, and I thought it would be remiss of me not to play or not to finish where the bees make honey because I know we've talked about this game. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, the, the story of this game is that I started this, I don't know, months ago, whatever it came to PS4, and it crashed on me and I corrupted my save, like, almost at the end. I'd say probably, like, 15 minutes or 10 minutes before the end. And so I just, you know, that was enough because there was no way I was going to do that rabbit section again with the controls. But Exactly. But I went... Oh, man. <laughs> Never played anything that was worth controlling, like, in years. And that tank controlling rabbit yeah yeah well i read recently that it had been patched and slightly improved so i thought you know look if i'm ever going to do it now would be the time and i'm not sure if it's been improved or not maybe i maybe it has slightly i mean it's hard to say i remember it was really frustrating it didn't seem as bad this time but but who knows maybe it's roughly the same the rest of the game has definitely not been improved it's uh it's still much the same and i i don't understand this game at all it has some really lovely music some beautiful moments and then they just do something just jarringly over the top that breaks the immersion and you know just a random buzzing noise or some just oh I don't, I don't get it so I know we talked about that briefly but I thought it was it was in my educational portfolio to finally finish that game seeing I was so close so I'm glad that I did that using the guide by the wonderful the mind is a city if you if anyone sees her please you know, thank her for that that's a guide that doesn't need to be used <laughs> no well that's true that's uh that's one of those games. I think there's one missable trophy, and it's in the first 20 minutes mm. of the game. Of an, of an hour long game, of yes. course. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, an hour is, is definitely long yeah. enough for that game, yeah. I think. So, look, and then, and then, look, going, going from that, from one extreme to the next, I played this uh, now 1980X or 198X. Oh, I did want to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah. I want to hear about this. So, look, on paper, this is definitely not my sort of game at all. You know, a, a collection of sort of retro arcade style games with a, a narrative thrown over the top. But in, in reality, I thought it was fantastic. Now, you know, listen to be warned, it is only a short experience. I mean, depending on your, your ability with the sort of arcade games, you could probably finish this in an hour, a first playthrough anyway, uh, you know, or, or even if you're not very good at it, maybe two hours or so. It, it's not, not hugely long. There are only sort of five arcade games that are, are put into the, the game and then there's a narrative story thrown over the top. Now it is totally '80s. The story, everything. So if you're a if you're a child of the early mid '80s, maybe the late '80s. I don't know. I think you'll associate with this a lot. The music is is fantastic, and it just really captures the grunge and the sort of the angstiness and all of that those elements of of that time. So I would I would highly recommend it. As far as the the trophies go, finishing the game is very easy. The checkpoint system is very generous in the arcade games, but the there are sort of half the list if you like of trophies require some pretty 
pretty intense sort of um, arcadey type skills, like you killing every every, uh, every monster or whatever machine, uh, flying machine, if you like, in the Space Invaders style level without taking any damage. That's pretty intense. The the car one is is not too bad, and oh, the the one that got me was the there's a, a, a side scrolling platformer, two D platformer. Uh, one which I had enough trouble just trying to get to the end of listeners actually there's a lot of words flying that afternoon the trophies for that are very difficult I believe so you know if, if you're going for the plat and that that'll be a good challenge for you but if you're just looking for the game experience that's fantastic and Mindy the funny thing about this game is again it suffers this weird price differential between the EU and the NA so I think it's ten dollars on the NA store and almost thirty dollars on the Australian store for some reason so what is going I look, on I don't know oh, that's they awful. Did that they did that with the Stranger Things game as well. Yes, yeah. yeah. Like by a lot, right? By like twenty or thirty dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good a good ten dollars more. Yeah, after conversion. Which is yeah, for for a for a game of this length is a lot. Yeah, I would agree. But look, you know, I, I would I would recommend uh that definitely. And I think there's uh there is two stacks of that, but you know, if you're only gonna play it once, then maybe the NA would be the way to go for, for price there. And look, you know, I don't know. Look, I've got to say, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. I don't know. I know. I know. Mindy's played this one. Have you got to this one yet, Corn? Or is this on the list for later? Yeah, I, I haven't done everything yet in it. I'm still working slowly on the platinum. I've been playing it since launch, <laughs> but it's like I play it. I play it like once a week. I get a chance to finally sit down and like I can play Assassin's Creed for a little bit, and it's like two hours. So two hours for months. I'm slowly getting to the end, but yeah, I, I've loved it though. I thought it was a beautiful game. It's almost too much. Yes, it's almost too much going on. It's a massive game, isn't it? It's just it's just unbelievable in size and, and scope. The, the thing that I find with this game, like, I, you know, as the listeners know, I love Final Fantasy fourteen. but the problem with Final Fantasy fourteen is there's no point loading it up if you only have an hour. There's, I mean, I'm sure you can make some progress, but you can't really. Like, you, you've got to have a few hours, you know, in your session. Otherwise, it's, it's no point trying. And I'm starting to get that feeling with Assassins that there's no point turning it on for half an hour. You really you really need a good few hours just to dig in and, and make progress. And, look, the exciting news for you, Corn, is when you do finish the Platinum and you get to the uh, DLC, that's pretty much just as long, the two DLCs, as the actual game, I think. So. And I, I heard that, and that's incredible. They, like... I know Assassin's Creed it kind of played out and people whatever at this point with the series, but I the last two games, Origin and Odyssey, are just massive. They're beautiful looking games, and I liked the changes overall to some of the gameplay that made them fun. Like I recommend those games. I loved them a lot. I'm still enjoying yeah, Odyssey. Yeah, no, look, it's great. And one of the things we, we talked about weeks ago was, you know, like trying to keep the narrative thread going in such a big game in the base game, which I think, you know, and there's a lot of different narrative threads going on in that game. But one of the things I liked was... Because there's just so, there's just so much stuff you don't have to... Do. It looks like you have to do it, exactly. but you really, really don't. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And and what I really liked about the, the first set of DLC, so there's three episodes, is that it's a, it's a bit of a tighter story, uh, you know, mainly, I suppose, because I've done everything else, well most of the base game stuff so i can focus on that uh, but it is on the map but it, what i like even better about the second and i'm not obviously no- are you talking are you talking about the atlantis dlc or the uh, the legacy there's two, of- right there's atlantis and there's yes something else yeah the legacy of the first blade yeah uh, it, that's the, the first set so that's set on the main map uh, the the map the base game set on but again the story's a little bit tighter and i i quite like that story arc it, it's different to the um to the main story, uh, but you know, I, I would recommend finishing the main story first. But I'm really enjoying the the second set of DLC, so the Fate of Atlantis, which is much more. I mean, th- that is, I'd say, I'd say the first set of DLC might take you, you know, anywhere from ten up to ten hours, depending on how you play, ten to twelve, you know, maybe maybe slightly more. But I think this second set will take you a lot longer, like twenty to thirty. There is just so much, depending on how deep you want to go into it. There's so much content and narrative content as well. So it, look, it's fantastic, but I, I don't know. I think I, I think I'm coming up to to needing a break from it because it's it's, it's kind of overwhelming. <laughs> Oh, it's way longer than five minutes. They should put a warning on it. But you know, anyway, that's that's my my <laughs> drama. So look, that's a that's that's quite a lot. I'm just proud that you're 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 you seem to actually be trying to finish it. That's not that's not common for you. Well, <laughs> the trophy I have left in the base game is to get all the tre- underwater treasures, which I don't want to do. So I'm not sure whether I'll do that one or not. That might just happen naturally. Maybe you know, I don't know. There, I will say for that, there is a, um, I can't remember where it was, but there's a weapon you can pick up 
uh, called Poseidon's Trident, and it has a, a rune inscribed on it that says you you can just breathe underwater. Makes that a lot quicker. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just think, yeah, I don't know, following a map around. But I don't have too many question marks left on the main map. So I think everything's marked as well, isn't it? So those treasures. So, well, Yeah, all those we'll underwater see. things are, are marked. Yeah, we'll see. But, you know, other than that, yeah, I think I'm doing okay on that one. You know, there's, there's a chance I may flat that. That would be shocking to me and everybody else, I'm sure. <laughs> we, you could throw a party. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So, look, you know, listeners, that gives you some ideas of what we've been playing this week, but why don't we have a look at what is new for this week? So we're recording, like, right up on release date pretty much this week. So what we're talking about now is either available or will be available within the next day or two. So with that in mind, Mindy, is there anything there out of this water 15 games in the drop this week that you would be uh, interested in? I will talk about something that I know is coming out, and it's it's the Vita port of Conga Master. And I'm gonna I'm gonna warn people about this game because I've been I, I have it on my profile. I've been dragging my heels on finishing it for one reason only, and that's because this game does not have stage select, and it desperately, desperately needs stage select. So about half of this list is is RNG based. Half of it is, you know, unlock certain characters. What you have to do is you have to get into the stage that they're in, collect them in your conga line and then get them out of the stage. And then they'll be added to like a, a roulette wheel where you can unlock them. The problem is that if you're and there's only like six stages in this game, I think. The problem is that if you miss someone in stage five, You can't just load up stage five and play. You have to start the game over again, get through stage one through four. And there's a weird difficult, at least for me, there's a weird difficulty spike in like stage three or four. It's whatever the one that is uh, the The back to the the future one. Back back to the future one. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really weird difficulty spike in that game. That's where I had it too. I did it on PS4. I got the platinum on PS4. And it's just, I was just looking at the list to see if it was the same. And it looks like the game's pretty much the same on Vita as it was PS4. The same trope. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much. It's not not fun, but it desperately needs stage select. Yeah, I don't understand. You can do a free play for it, but it doesn't count. You can't unlock stuff in it. Yeah. I don't think. But yeah. there is a, but yeah, it's dumb. I agree with you. It took me a little bit. And actually, at first, there was a glitch that even when, uh, on the PS4 version, I just this game stuck out because I got everything. I got unlocked everybody, but I didn't get the trophy for unlocking everyone. So I spent hours trying to figure out some secret character to unlock, and no one's talking about the game. I emailed the developer, and then, oh, yeah, no, it's glitched. We haven't fixed it. And then they fixed it, like, the next week, and I finally got my platinum. <laughs> Well, con- con- congratulations. I'm dragging my heels on it. I did. Oh, I did find out something kind of weird, actually was I um I was in the last level of the game and I thought cuz there's uh uh like a secret stage in this game where if you get uh if you pick up a I think it's a cat in each in each level and you yep. pick up all the cats you get like another like a final stage and there's a trophy for doing that and I think one of the characters is only in that stage I can't remember but I was pretty sure I had it right and so I was like oh but I can't turn off the game because i'll lose all the progress and i was on this stage the final stage which is on like a spaceship and there's a ball by the way there's a boss fight in this game which should not happen i agree so i paused the game and i went out to like dinner or something and i came back a couple hours later and i don't think i don't think the stage stops when the game pauses like the timer stops but when i unpause the game literally every alien on that spaceship was right next to me and i just had to i just had to hit the stick and i picked up (laughs) every single thing in that stage and i still had to do the boss fight but i was like that was insanely easy to get through that stage so maybe i just need to do that maybe i need to load up a stage pause the game for like six hours that is weird Unpause it, collect everything, get into the next stage, pause it. <laughs> <laughs> Mindy, do you have the drop open by any chance at the moment? Yes, I do. Why? I'm just looking at the picture there of Congo Master Go. Can you tell me, uh, my eyesight's, you know, in my old age is going a bit. What is that thing in the top left next to the uh, the Congo it's Master just Word? At that. What is that? that is... You've played the game. That might be one of the aliens. Yeah, it's just that pink thing. Oh. It's one of the aliens. 
Yeah. 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 Oh, that could be a few things. But Can I have all the pigs? We'll go with the that. pigs are cool. Yeah, I like the pig. Yeah. And the handsy yeah. guy there as well. Okay, excellent. <laughs> oh, there's a lot going on in that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, there is. Uh, so, look, I'm going to throw out one as well, the Smoots Summer Game. So for those of you that like these sort of, you know, like cheesy, you know, sort of sporty, arcade Olympic style type of things, you, you may be looking out for this. A couple of weeks ago we got the infamous Summer Sports Games, which I, I really cannot recommend at all. It's only a 100% game. It came in way overpriced on the store and a little misleading perhaps in the trailer, but the game basically breaks down to just a button prompt QTE uh, experience or whatever else so I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that but this uh smooth summer games this might be the the solution if you if you're sort of hanging out for something like this yeah so it says here get the gold medal play athletics events from your sofa prepare yourself for the next season Smooth Summer Games is a sport arcade game for wonderful players where you can play 18 athletic events Never leave your couch. Play with your favorite smooth character in practice, special challenge, and championship game modes. So I don't know if that interests either of you two, but I'm a sucker for these type of games. So I'll definitely be uh, I'll definitely be all over that. And I believe that comes out on on Friday. Yeah. Is it is there anything you'd like to throw out there, uh, Corn, that interests you? Uh, the big thing for me this week is uh, is Wolfenstein, the new Wolfenstein, uh, new blood uh, hits or young blood. Sorry, not new blood, young blood. Every every Wolfenstein's blood. They have old blood, new blood, young blood, and a lot of blood. Um, <laughs> but I, I love I love the concept of you're playing as the daughters of B.J. Blazkowicz, and you're in the '80s, and I'm a huge like sucker for anything '80s, especially the neon pink and synth wave music and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I liked uh, the last one, the New Colossus or whatever. I, I thought it was great. So you you must have loved uh, Far Cry Blood Dragon then. Loved Blood Dragon. I was so mad it didn't have a platinum on its own. Um, it just was like 100% DLC or whatever. But uh, yeah, no, I loved Blood Dragon. I hope that they eventually like a full game or a sequel at least to that. Because yeah, no, I love that. I'm a sucker for it. So pretty much a game, it, it has anything like that. I'm probably going to at least play it. Mm. This series is becoming more cutting as well with its dialogue. I don't know. Did you play the 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 Wolfenstein release before this? Uh, I don't know which blood it was. Yeah, the old Colossus, <laughs> the, the Colossus. Or yeah. no, that one was actually Colossus. Uh, surprisingly, it wasn't blood in the title no. or whatever. But yeah, no, I did. And um, no, I very much enjoyed it. I, I didn't get to play it until a few months after release, so I didn't really review it. Yeah. I, I I really did enjoy it. I've liked all of the new Bethesda published Wolfenstein titles. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that yeah, that is the definitely the big release this week, and it's co-op as well. This one, I know there's a there's another one. There's a there's a VR Wolfenstein. Uh, the, the VR pilot, yeah, yeah, with the mech. Is that is that like a tie-in to this, or is it a, like I know it's also in the in the 80s. I don't have the VR, so I'm not really up on it. But is it is it like a spin-off to this game, or is it something completely separate? Yeah. It's the same same setting, also in Paris. You're still fighting Nazis, but you're in that big cyber pilot mech suit thing. Uh, but yeah, they're both related. They're in the same thing, same era, same universe and stuff. 1980s Paris of the alt okay. history where the Nazis took over. They are they are selling them as separate on the store, although I must admit, my own fault, I should have checked uh, whether the deluxe edition actually comes with both, the digital deluxe. I'm not sure, but they're actually quite reasonably priced games. I think even the main one is not a full price game. I think I saw it in the NA store, so there you go. Uh, that could be could be something and then look you know it would be it would be uh it would be bad of us not to mention remiss. A rem <laughs> a remiss, yes it would be very remiss of us not to mention a vn that's come out this week uh the <laughs> i'm sure i'm the only one here that's played this uh data live rio uh reincarnation <laughs> am i the only one yes <laughs> probably because it was only in japanese before i was gonna say yeah it's uh, one of the compile heart compile heart games other than that i don't know anything else about it other than it's compile heart and idea factory yeah, or whatever. yeah oh, look, so that'll be there that'll probably be expensive so look you know good luck if you're going to read that or skip that they're not they're not um they're not my cup of tea uh those ones wait if it's if it's compile heart it might not be just a visual novel it might be one of those um uh, like dungeon dungeon crawler vns like uh like oh what's it called and you know, you battle with cards of, of women and they're all like 14. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, 
I know what you're referring to. Yeah, I think this is the port from the Japanese version, though, that is a VM. But look, listen, as I could be, I could be. Yeah, it looks like from everything I'm seeing, it looks like a visual novel. Though being, uh, it totally could have been something else. But yeah, it looks like this case it is. Yeah. That. Yeah, it's actually it's a, it is a series, but I think this yeah, is the, yeah. the first port in English. Yeah, that's come. Yeah, any anyway, and but look, you know, anyway, look, uh, that that is there for you. And look, there's just a bunch of other stuff that I've never heard of <laughs> in there as well. So I'm sure you'll you'll find something something there, listeners. Yeah, unless anyone else has got anything. Well, else I'm sure to... I'm sure we'll we'll cover some of these on uh, in a couple of days when we record another podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, it's uh, hopefully smooths us out. We will. We will see by then. So look, we're 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 slowly making up. We're making good time and good progress today. I'm enjoying this. So why don't we quickly go across and just do a little bit of news? I think we have two sort of items we want to bring up. And so the first one I want to talk about because it's a bit of a passion project for me is this. Now I know it has been covered a little bit already on other. Um, on other platforms, uh, other podcasts as well. But I do want to just touch on it because uh, some people have given it very little coverage and others have given it coverage that's just different to, to the way uh, I, I see it, I suppose. Um, and I'm interested to see what what uh, Mindy and, of course, Korn think as well. And so what we're referring to is the uh, Ubisoft and the Hit Records merging or coming together again, not for the first time, but to source some music for Watch Dogs 3 from the community. So there are there are articles on IGN and around the place where you can read about this, but just in, in general gist, the idea with hit records is that it's a, a collaborative community effort where you can you can write a part of a song a whole song you can remix you can add you can arrange look you can do anything you want pitch shift perhaps might be a good idea for some of their stuff um, if someone's not already doing that and uh and then you get a if, if your song's chosen you get a portion of a, a two thousand dollar payment percentage depending on on the the level of work you did so just you know i just wanted to throw out to mindy and to corn like how do you feel about stuff like this like Corn, do you have any opinion on this sort of thing, or I'm I'm completely against uh, artists not being getting what they deserve, not getting paid the way they're supposed to. I hate the idea of doing work for exposure. You know, if you're doing work, you should get paid for it. And taking this way out, when you're a company like Ubisoft and you're making all this money and you make a lot of money, pay your people and pay them well. There's no need in this modern world to not pay your people well. When you're doing so well as a company, it gets on my nerves. Yeah, it worries me a little bit, CJ, that you just said you get a portion of a two thousand dollar payment. Depending on That's how correct. much they're sourcing, you you pretty much would just be working for exposure. What are you getting? Three cents out of the two thousand dollar payment? You know what I mean? Uh, of course, yes. It'd be it'd be one thing if they said we have two grand, we want ten songs. You know, each each group, what you know, whether you're one person or you're a group of twelve, you know, if you give us a song that we use, you're getting X amount. You know, we're dividing it up equally, and then what you do, how you distribute the the chunk you got in your group, is up to you. That's very different than we have two grand that we're going to spend on music. We're going to take every song that comes our way, but you know, it's like it's like a, a what is it called a. a like a class action settlement in a lawsuit. Like, yeah, it sounds great when a company pays out $6 million, but then you look at how many people were in this class action lawsuit and you're like, oh, actually people are getting... So it really kind of depends. Yeah, look, look, I, I agree. And look, n- not to play the devil's advocate because I can't agree with this practice in, in principle either coming from, you know, and I mean, it's interesting because Corn obviously a content creator as well. So, you know, and I'm not I'm not referring here to the, the podcast, but my day-to-day job, I can't agree with working for exposure. I mean, that is something that is thrown out in the arts industry from from the very beginning when you start. And it, it, it is a cop-out and a, and a way to scam people, I think. And unfortunately, it's a way to scam people that are starting out in the industry. Usually it doesn't affect people that are already established but on the other side i mean ubisoft have actually licensed 140 songs for the game so they are paying you know professionals and composers as well so i think what the idea behind this and not making any allowances for it is that it can allow hobbyists to have a chance to get into the game you know i suppose to put put stuff into the game but so what i propose to both of you is if you took the cash payment away completely and you offered i don't know like points or you know just your name in the credit somewhere or something do you think that might have been a better way to handle this so for hobbyists not not to necessarily have any money involved but you know you can just you you can have a chance to have something in the game and we'll give you some sort of nominal credit for that what do you feel about that that's still exposure 
that's still working for exposure. That's exactly the line. Uh, of course. But, like, but see, I don't think this is appealing to anyone that would be trying to make a living from this. Like this, I, I don't understand this hit records premise for someone like, uh, you know, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who's behind it, you know, an actor who, who would not have worked for exposure would definitely not work for exposure now. I, I think this is definitely... You know, he's been working consistently since he was a little kid. Right. I mean, he was Angels in the Outfield and everything else. So like, he's never not had an acting job. That's right. Yeah, and I mean, it, it reeks of it reeks of a um, you know a hobbyist endeavor. This website and this this hit record idea, which look again, I have no problem with. But I mean, the the flip side of these sort of things are, especially in music, because music is very challenging in any field to make a living out of. You know, writing or anything else, maybe without you know, with the exception of the education field where it's a little easier. But in in the performing performing or writing side, it's very challenging, and there are only a number, a handful of people that are skilled enough to do it. Unfortunately, you know, that have gone through the training and it is years of training i know people you know learn in their garage and everything else but to write properly takes takes a long time obviously a, a refined craft and these sort of things it just it just takes away even if there's only fifty thousand in the pool that's fifty thousand that could have gone to you know someone who's maybe you know straight out of uh, music school or whatever else that has learned and to help them out so i think that's that's sort of my point. Like, I, under, I, I totally understand the the exposure, you know, the, the side for for people that are just hobbyists that, you know, they have another job or whatever else. But I can't, like like the two of you, I feel, I can't necessarily agree with this uh, on the on the basis of, you know, I mean, in a way, it's a scary, it's a scary trend to follow, I feel. I don't know. Do you think this will become more commonplace? I'm hoping it does the opposite in this this gets enough negative backlash that companies will realize that no, if we're going to include something, even as like kind of almost a contest, that we need to compensate them correctly. It's a it's a million dollar, billion dollar industry, whatever the heck video games make at this point, and you're one of the major players in it. You're you need to pay now. If granted, if this was working with some small little indie company, the one person by himself, and he did this, you know, it's different. But major companies, no reason, no excuse not to pay properly. It's just trying to save a buck, say, uh, you know, to help your bottom line, and it's not acceptable. Mm. Yeah, look, I, I totally agree. I, uh, I, I did some work, uh, some marketing work for a, a company several years ago that released a, um, a PC game. I, I'm going to be very, very vague with what I'm saying here because I don't name and shame. But one of my jobs was to source uh, artists. And say, and basically say, hey, will you draw some art for this game? You'll be paid an exposure. And I felt so dirty, so very dirty doing it. I finally talked to someone who is higher up in the company than me and said, can we at least give them a copy of the game? Like give them some sort of comp. I get that you're not, I mean, I feel like you should have it in your budget to pay these people, but Mm. can we at least give them a copy of the game? Like that's got to cost you. It's going to cost you something, but it's it's a digital code. Like I mean, at this point, everything's everything's digital codes now. So honestly, I mean, yeah, it does cost something, I guess, but it really is nothing. Digital codes. I mean, there, some companies, there's so many of them. Yeah. There's no reason, no excuse to at least not give someone a dang code when you do art for it. You're in the game. You worked on the game. Like at least. You get so thankfully, thankfully, they did. They did give. Uh, cause people don't want to work for exposure. So that campaign did not go well. So they ended up finding some money to pay someone, to pay a couple of people from, I think Fiverr. I think I found them on Fiverr and they were very good. I'm not, I'm not, d- uh, bashing on people on Fiverr at all. They were very good artists, but, oh, suddenly there is money in the advertising budget to pay the artists. <laughs> Gotta love and it. so the, Gotta the two that. or three people who did make just, just art. And it was, again, it was good art for free and for exposure i was like please give these people a copy of the game and uh and they did so at least i didn't feel yeah, as dirty that's but. right yeah well look i think the three of us have been around the block a bit so we know we sort of read underlying what this is but you know rather than just rag on it completely i thought i'd just throw out some ideas you know if you're if you are trying to get into this music industry and writing in any form you know and, and you're looking for alternatives and you're like well you know it's, it's fair enough for them to say that because you know they're doing whatever they're doing but you know this might be the only option i can see there are many other options that you don't need to do this for what i would recommend is you know the, the dream of writing for a triple a studio does not happen overnight at all you know or a major advertising agency what i would suggest is if this really does interest you is start putting together a portfolio of your own stuff don't give it to anyone else keep it for yourself write about an hour's worth of music that's what you'll be required for most advertising agencies showing a variety of styles and then 
after you've done that, start to contact indie devs because most of them have very small budgets for music, if if any budget at all, but they will give you uh, the contacts, and again, without using the word the exposure, to, to at least get your name out there. And the good deal with them is that you can maintain the licensing of your music. That is a paramount as a musician. You should never, ever go into any of these things where you give away the license, which is what is happening here in this hit record, unless you're making substantial money uh, upwards because you won't make anything on the back end once you sign away your music. So just little things to think about. Oh, I I miss that. You 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 do this, and Ubisoft gets the rights to your song. Hit Record takes the rights. Yes, that's part of the deal. Yeah. So which oh, I miss that yeah. part. Oh, that definitely sounds like a bad idea. Yeah, and look, I know it's tempting when you're starting out to do these things, but you know, look, there there is always you know some unpaid work at the start. You know, in any of these professions, but make sure you always retain the rights, particularly if it is unpaid work, because it's so important. You never know when you'll need to use it again uh, under the pump or whatever else. So I would recommend that. And just as a guide, you know, for people that are outside the industry thinking, well, you know, to something of two thousand is is not too bad. Just to give you an idea, for writing for an advertising house on a on a on a small release, so we're talking like a national level, you'd be looking to get paid around $5,000 a minute for music. For a major level, like a, a major game, you could be looking anywhere up to 50000 to to 100000 for some of the Japanese composers uh, for, for, you know, a reel of like a couple of minutes of music. So it, 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 the, the amount of, and, and withholding the license. So you can see the discrepancies there in what they're paying is astronomical for people already in the industry. But look, I don't want to, I don't want to preach any more than I already have on that and that topic. <laughs> Uh, that was fun, but I did I did want to say that. So unless anyone else has anything they want to add to that, we'll, we'll... no, I, I I fully agree. I mean, some of my favorite composers that are like the modern day big composers in games, their first projects were some awful, crappy games or games you've never heard of. But the music was great. You could just immediately, I played so many bad games where it was like, well, the music's still good. And then look into the composer and see what they've done. Just, wherever you start doesn't matter. It's where exactly. you finish. Just don't, you don't get, you, you can't give up and don't give up, like you said, the rights to your stuff or else you never know what they're going to use it for or what's going to happen right. to it. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's so I know it's always tempting, you know, a payout at the at the front end, but you know, trust me, it's definitely worth holding on for the for the back end. That's where where the money has to come in. Just ask the creator of the Witcher <laughs> series, because you know he doesn't he doesn't make any money off That's, the video games because he took a lump that sum. That is right. Yeah, but I understood that he he didn't really have any time for games anyway. He didn't think it would amount to anything. So. He didn't like them. <laughs> but um, yeah, he didn't think no. it was going to do anything. But I do believe there's a case going on over there where he in the law there they have a bizarre copyright uh situation over there uh in the there uh, that allows him to now sue them for for you know basically potential earns based on the fact that he never considered that would be a thing which which is bizarre like that would never happen in america or australia but exactly but, uh, <laughs> just you know that's interesting and if he somehow win i mean it's a large chunk of money potentially just based on witcher 3 sales so i don't know yes. that's, a, that's a very dangerous legal yeah, precedent in, in, uh, in the state Yes. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> well I didn't yeah. think it would happen. No, it, it is very interesting. So, look, let, let's let's shuffle across now. We've flooded your ears, listeners, with lots of useless and, and factual, you know, trivia, <laughs> if you like. But now let's let's turn our things to to our guest today, Corn, and and reviews, if you would. So, can I can I start the ball rolling by you know, obviously you've been doing this for quite some time. W- what attracts you to reviews? Like, why 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 do it? Well, I've always. I've been playing games forever and people always ask you, you know, if you're the gamer in your friends group or whatever, ask me what I think about a game. And uh, in high school, uh, for my school newspaper, I wrote video game reviews and movie reviews for my school paper. And I did a few on websites and stuff. So even way before I did YouTube, I was interested in doing reviews and stuff like that. I just found it fascinating to kind of get, you know, my opinion out there. And I just kind of did it as a test. I my channel was failing. I was doing very bad uh, ad revenue wise. I was making less than a hundred dollars a month in ad revenue and I needed to turn something around. I was losing my savings. I was doing mostly just the YouTube. I had a couple of side projects, but it wasn't like now where I kind of have a couple of side deals while I'm also doing the YouTube full time. So I needed to do something different. I tried a couple of reviews. Uh, They did well for me view wise and it just kind of started spiraling down and I realized This is at least maybe it's not my best work. I'm never going to say my reviews are the greatest reviews in the world, but clearly there's something to them and enough people like them enough that uh, my channel has doubled, if not tripled in size in the last few years since I started them. Now, you you review just about everything. 
And with a, and it's great that that doing the reviews turned your turned your channel around. I I will say I, d- I really did like the play it throughs, and I was a little bummed when they you know they slowed down. But I totally get why. But at the same time, that's got to be an increase in operation costs for you, right? Or are the majority of the things you're getting are they review copies? At first, I got nothing. Uh, for the first year I did reviews, I bought, or over a year, I bought every game. My very first code I ever got, it was kind of like a celebratory thing because it was like a company contacted me to review their game. I didn't send an email. I hadn't been doing that or anything because I didn't think I was established enough to get any sort of review codes or anything like that. I had no idea how any of it worked. So a company for the game Brutal uh, that came out on PlayStation 4, which is a really neat little dungeon crawler, but it's all ASCII art. It's really weird, but it came out a few years ago, like 2015 or 2016, 2016 must have been, and they sent me the code. I was like, awesome, and I did the review, and ever since then, I slowly then started the email companies and just hit them up, and it's it's a balance. I always have in the description of my reviews whether or not I received it via code or whether or not I purchased myself or even sometimes if I was on the Kickstarter. So it's just one of those things. I I completely am open about that. I don't say it in the reviews. It's not something I have to, like every single time some people want to open that up with that. You know, it's right there though, at the top, near the top of my description and I don't hide it from anything. Uh, But that helps a lot. So now I can buy the few extra games that I really think are worth purchasing that I know I won't receive code wise. And at least I always have this consistent amount of games I can review. So stuff coming in via code and stuff I can buy. Mm. So I noticed that you've done 75 reviews this year already. So it must be time intensive to do these reviews. Do you do you like have to finish the whole game to review it or do you do you feel you only have to play a certain amount of the game or I, how, how does that sort of work? If it's your typical narrative game, I finish it. If it's a game that's a very open kind of experience where you can sink potentially hundreds of hours in the open world and stuff, I do as much of the activities and as stuff as I possibly can. I test out every mechanic of a game and I try to work it as, you know, the mechanics out and make sure to see if they actually work, if they break over excessive use, whatever it may be. And uh, I do my absolute best to finish every single game I play. But there are those games that are more open-ended that don't necessarily have the traditional ending or the story may only be eight hours, but there's like 30 hours of bonus content to do. I may do 10 to 15 hours of the open world bonus collecting and other content and then get my review out to make sure that at least it's out there as my opinion and score at that point wouldn't have changed either way because it's just that extra stuff. Can I ask you this now? Feel free if you don't want to answer this. This is totally fine. But uh, you're, so I've, I've listened to numerous of your reviews now. Do you script the, the speech afterwards or do you just talk? No. I just talk. Yeah, I'm very, very I have notes. I, I, I play every game I play. I have notepad open on my laptop and I write little notes. But it's like game crashed one time, game crashed two times. Um, I liked this level. I liked this boss in particular. Just tiny little notes that I then turn into the three to five, six minute reviews that I do. And I found at this point doing so many reviews that about three to six minutes is a sweet spot as viewers will don't watch reviews longer than that. They skip ahead to get by the point they're about five minutes in, they'll skip ahead to the end just to see the score and then move on. You can thankfully YouTube does a decent enough job showing me the viewership, the minutes watched and what's watched in a video. And after years of doing this and studying it, I kind of found that sweet spot. So some people want longer reviews. I get that. Now, getting them out in that, that little four to five minute window, six minute window I've done has allowed me to kind of get this like really kind of a quick, uh, it's a very efficient machine almost at this point of playing footage, record and get those video reviews out. And it's like clockwork. It takes me like nothing at this point to get them done. Now, I remember when you when you first started doing reviews, you were uh, an on camera reviewer. You don't seem Correct. to do that anymore. Is it a, is it a a, a, a time saving thing? Is it a huge time save? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it it cuts down the time of doing a review uh, by two thirds, mm-hmm. I'd say, because before when I'm recording on uh, my computer direct audio, because I with my camcorder, I was using the microphone attached to the camcorder. Uh, so doing an editing takes of where the audio would be was a lot harder to do on the camera. Like if I'm in the middle of a take and I mess up and then I want to kind of restart mid take, it was near impossible to do with the camera. Whereas on the computer, I can instantly kind of blend those lines and get the you know right inflections and stuff on my word and all that kind of stuff and, and make it flow better. That greatly helped. And plus, I 
me being directly on camera for the first 30 seconds and last 30 seconds of a review, I don't did not end up affecting any viewership. In fact, viewership is the same, if not much higher, since I stopped doing it. So it wasn't something that I needed to include. So it's like one less headache, makes my life easier. Reviews don't lose any quality. I, I didn't see a need to do it. Now, I do plan to do videos again in the future where I'm on camera. I've um, lost a lot of weight in the last year and a half. I've been really working on my health. Uh, I also didn't like the way I looked back then, to be honest. I don't like being on camera necessarily all the time. Yeah, that's interesting. What, one thing, uh, I, you know, the reason I asked for it, it's scripted was you, you're you're very concise with your reviews. Like you mentioned that there are only sort of three to six minutes, which I think, you know, I think is a paramount thing. I know that there are some some people starting out with reviews that are making them longer, around the eight to ten minutes, which, again, as you say, you know, I made a I made a forty minute Fallout Four review, and it barely cracked a thousand <laughs> views or at the time of launch. Because it was right when I started doing reviews. Um, I started in September of twenty fifteen, and then it was like November twenty fifteen Fallout Four. So it was like one of my big for reviews, and I worked really hard on it, hundred hours in the Fallout Four, get this review done, forty minutes long. No one watched it. No one cares. Still, no one's watched it or cared. So I learned pretty yeah. quickly. Longer doesn't mean. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I mean, that's that's the impression that I got because it's very clear, having listened to 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 a few of your reviews, that you do follow a formula. You start with a, you know a clever clever witticism at the start, which I quite like. I try. I try to be clever. I try. Like they're and they're all on the fly. Yeah. I don't think of them ahead of time. I'm not writing them down. It's just whatever I come with. So sometimes they're gold, and other times they're awful. Yeah. And I know they are, but it's kind of like a trademark at this point. And I kind of enjoy coming up with it. And if I can come up with the more ridiculous pun, yeah. the better. No, I, I appreciate that. I think more power to you. I like that idea. And then what I like is you, you 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 dump a lot of information, factual information in, you know, within a minute or two or whatever else, which I think is good because I think some of the reviews, you know, they just tend to they tend to drag on and they're they they it's very difficult because I understand as a critic you're you're giving your personal, you know, reaction to it as well. But they does need to be an element, I'm sure you would agree of actual factual information in there as well that is separate from you that is just what exists within the in the game so you're very concise with that but then you do move on and you judge the game in some way like you say you know you, know, you, you prefer to see this or that I um, you know obviously you have hundreds of videos so I have not seen them all I do you ever find you sense yourself slightly like to what you feel like you're, you're a little bit kinder or does that not bother you anymore um well, it's um, it's funny when I do my play it throughs and I'm practicing or when I'm playing games, I uh, I can I don't I don't have like anger or throwing controllers or anything like that. But I do curse and I'm like, you know, I hate this game. I don't really hate the game, but I'm like, I hate this game at this moment, you know, that kind of thing. And I very elaborate and then the very, uh, you know, doing the motions and hand motion and getting really angry at these games. And then I sit down and do a review and I'm just like, OK, time to calm down. Just give that direct lines and i think being you can you know being animated and all is great and that works for a lot of people i like some of the idea of just kind of give it like sometimes i'll give harsh criticism of a game but i do so in a way that to some people i will oh that didn't seem so bad but it makes, to me i like you know uh, verbally eviscerated it uh, to some degree and i'll even feel bad sometimes after certain games because i i do feel bad giving bad reviews I don't want to give a bad review. <laughs> it's just one of those things. I will say one of the things I, I really like about your reviews is most games media, an average review is like a seven. And that's kind of the unspoken agreement where, you know, if, if a publication didn't like a game, they give it like a seven. And that keeps, you know, that keeps the, the company happy. It keeps the publisher in business and doing business with the, com with the game companies. And everyone's happy. Your average review really is a five. It really is. Yeah, if I give it a bubble five, I think it's worthy of some redeeming quality of its genre. Like, if it's a yeah. bubble five for me, like, it may not be the best game. I give a lot of sevens. I'm not going to lie and say I don't give a lot of sevens, but it's not, like, the same seven to me. I call it the Game Informer rule. Game Informer, when I was working at GameStop, I looked at every, I would read Game Informer every month because I'm uh, there. You were, you were at GameStop, too. Yeah. Yeah, I worked for four uh, years. I worked, up. I worked there off and on for about seven years. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so that I have wonderful all the great stories from that. But uh, so I would read Game Informer, and that's kind of when I noticed that trend. And then IGN followed just the same thing. These were all of a sudden seven is like the code word for mediocre game. And I'm like, we have a scale of one to ten. Let's use it. Like, I don't understand. I get like some people are like, well, it's a grading system because seventy is like a C. 
And I'm like, well, then give it a C. A through F. That's not hard. Why are we giving, you know, I, I feel like people are complicating it. And it just made it where mediocre games still get a seven. So that some people will be like, hmm, I may still buy that because at least it got a seven. Where in reality, it should be a five or a four. Yeah. Well, and it would make it even more jarring, right? Because Game Informer would give out, it was rare, but they would give out scores lower than a seven. And so you'd, you'd see something with like a. My guess was they didn't pay GameStop. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of, I kind of feel like that's that's an issue there. Uh-huh. I do have a random, random question here before we move on to something with more substance. Yeah. I, I'm just doing a really quick view right now, and from what I'm seeing listed, so your reviews, you tend to average about one and a half to two and a half thousand views per review, and that's, I mean, that's that's nothing to sneeze at. Yeah, and um, and the key with that is, um, people. I, I'm not looking for huge numbers. I never have, and I don't expect my channel ever to be that huge. But for me, it's like at least a thousand views to me is something decent. It, it's it's whatever. Mm-hmm. It's based on how many people are searching for that game. I review a game if it's popular, I do well. If it doesn't end up being popular, exactly. I don't do as well view wise. But I'm in the top, I'm in the top search results. Like I can't do much better. Yeah. You know. So my question is, and maybe you don't have an answer for this. It seems to me like your review with the m- biggest, the most amount of hit. Oh God, yes. Okay, yeah. Is is the Hunter Call of the Wild with two hundred and twenty six thousand views? I learned very early some reason that hunting games do extremely well view wise. One of my other biggest viewed videos is The Hunter, and I've reviewed a few other hunting games that have done well for me. I think it's a combination of people don't cover those games. And they don't un- they underestimate the amount of people that play those games, because um, for example, my dad plays nothing. He doesn't play video games anymore, but he plays two things: flight simulators and hunting games. So there's still an audience out there that wants that immersive hunting experience. And I guess because I was the one who reviewed it at that time for PS4, and I was the only one who covered, I think at the time, the PS4 version in particular. Others had covered PC. That's why it was able to do so well. It just There is a fair amount of people looking for reviews on hunting games. And around the world, a lot of people play these games. Yeah, that's it surprised me at first, but I, you know, over time, I'm just like, I guess there's a lot of people that like them. It's just, it was just such a big, a big jump. Like, you know, and it looks like the next the next one that isn't a hunting game is like Amnesia, and that's that's not quite cracked a hundred thousand. It's uh, I have Amnesia collection the hundred. I'm just looking at my thing is one hundred sixteen thousand. It may be different listings. I don't know what it, whatever. But that got lucky with Amnesia collection because of PlayStation Plus. That PlayStation Plus is my savior, and I don't right like, because every single month that a game comes out, if I've reviewed it. It's not even funny. Like, I double, triple my views. For example, Amnesia Collection, it was a pre-PlayStation Plus game in October of either last year or the year before, whatever it was, 2017 maybe. I only had like 15,000 views going into the month, maybe 20,000. By the end of the month, I was over that 100,000 mark just because of PlayStation Plus people looking for games. That's crazy. I, I'm I'm sure, like I said, you, you review everything. So I'm sure this will happen to you uh you know, it's yeah. more than just a fluke, yeah. I suppose. That is an interesting effect, isn't it? Yeah, um, the game this month, the uh, Horizon uh, Chase Turbo, that's free on Plus. I had 10,000 views going into the month, and I'm over 35,000 views. <laughs> it's just PlayStation Plus means people are looking for the review. Even though it's a free game that they're gonna, they can download, downloading takes so much time, especially with bigger games. They still rather look mm-hmm. at a review to see if it's even worth downloading. Moving to a more general question now, if I could. Uh, so uh, often, you know, the term reviewer and critic are, uh, you know, interposed, you know, between each other, you know, and, and, and many, many people see it the same way. Do you, do you see it the same way yourself? Would you classify yourself as a critic as well? Are they the same thing? Um, I, I mean, I think they could easily be the same thing as far as, you know, is it, a, am I a reviewer? Am I a critic? Uh, I, I look at more on the reviewer. I like to give what my goal in my reviews is, is not to tell you my opinion necessarily. Yes, that's in there. That is totally in there. But my real goal is just to try to inform the consumer on what this game's about. Does it at least play okay? And if they like certain other games or other genres or that particular genre, will this game be worthy of their money? And that's all I really want from my reviews is to help somebody make that purchasing decision. I don't give a crap whether or not they agree. You know, you don't have to agree with my scores. And my scores, are even to me, are kind of arbitrary sometimes. It's, it's you know, between the 7 and an 8, what time is, what is the difference sometimes, you know? But 
Yeah, that, that's kind of thing. I'm, I, I review. I, if I want to sit there and really critique something and, and then critique like the coding of something or the gra every little graphical detail of something like, uh, especially when ports happen with PC versions of games and stuff like that, it's just not something that I feel like I need to dive into. That's not what I like to do with my reviews. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. I'm, I'm not trying to push you on that, that angle there. Oh, uh, no, no, at no. All. Just, I, just, I, it's an interesting idea. Yeah, I find the distinction interesting because, I mean, personally, from from my view, I find, find that I don't tend to read reviews or critiques very often, but I understand why people do. I come up with the attitude that I don't like things spoiled or whatever else. So I suppose if I were to watch something, I would definitely tend towards the reviewer side because I think, you know, I understand why critiques are important, obviously, for people that maybe aren't immersed in that, that in, in, you know, environment or that ecosystem. It provides things to look at. But the more immersed you are in yourself, I, I think that, that, as you say, you know, it, it can kind of break down a little bit into, you know, personal taste and, and you know, preference and stuff like that and then it gets gets away from the thing so no I, I totally understand where you're um you're digging at there so with that that in mind can i ask you what was your favorite game to review do you have a favorite so far and least favorite oh uh least favorite is any of the games by uh gilson pontius or whatever his name is the guy who created <laughs> soul brain night of darkness and all yep, all those things um those are always my least favorite games to review i reviewed a few of them i gave up the last one i didn't he came out with i didn't even review i'm like it's not any different other than you're on a dragon now it's the same damn game he's really sorry excuse me i didn't mean to curse um the same game three four times and i'm just like spirit destiny sword of fortress or whatever soul brain out of darkness absolutely the worst ones uh soul brain is by far the worst because it stole all those assets from uh Smash it, right? brothers and no it wasn't it was um it was literally the font from legend of zelda the uh voice of lucinda from super smash brothers the soundtrack of ori and the blind forest uh the um the the 3d models were from lineage 2 i think uh and a few other things so that was amongst the stolen assets that were used for that game so yeah that's why that one's my least favorite um as but far that, as my, at least that got pulled right like that's not still up for that, one did. that one thankfully did get pulled however what he decided to do was then just take uh asset packs and I, I can't, you know, whatever, prove that they were stolen, but some people were saying they were even stolen. I don't know if that's true. But then taking just these asset packs from Unity and popping out these extremely awful games for a large amount of money and then faking the rating system too on the PlayStation Store. If you go to any of his games, they have like hundreds of five-star reviews. There's just something that's wrong with this game. And, and he sh the company shouldn't have even, I think, be allowed to publish any more games on the platform once it was proven that they had stolen assets in the past. Sure, he'll have Sock Puppet account. If, if he's that much of an asset no, clipper, he's sure to have Sock Puppet accounts that he can publish <laughs> under. I just think Sony at this point, should, they can say, he even puts his name on every single one of his games, so it's not like it's, it's even hiding in plain sight. I'm not sure if I have an absolute favorite. I love horror a lot, uh, so anytime I get to review a really cool horror game, I love getting to like, dive into the Resident Evil universe. It's one of my favorite uh, video game series of all time. I also like it when I get to review the more obscure, different genre out there titles as opposed to the more traditional stuff. I definitely prefer if a game at least looks different than everything else I'm currently playing. Like that's always uh, a big, a big plus for me. Favorite horror game this year that's come out? Uh, favorite. I mean, Resident Evil 2's remake is technically horror, so I would. That's my favorite. Far and I put more hours into Resident Evil 2's remake than probably anything else I've played this year. That's a fantastic game. Other than no, sorry, I I apologize. Other than Serolim Three, Serolim uh -huh. Three, I put probably a hundred hours in. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an obscure little series yeah. that like not very many people have. Uh, Layers of Fear Two was also really really cool. Mm. It's like it's jump scary, that kind of stuff. But as a huge movie fan as well, like it was a joy to play through and look at Layers of Fear 2. Is it better than the first? Because the first one was it, it seemed to be like just a just a YouTube screamer kind of game. Uh, to a degree. Uh, the first one was it's a lot of that, but it had that really cool art gimmick to it so at least aesthetically it was something cool to look at amongst the really whatever generic jump scares and they also yeah. built on the uh mental stuff that was seen in the pp demo like that kind of tricking you a little bit or being out of the ordinary while you're still doing the mundane walking basically and throwing those jump scares at least you were visually looking at something cool 
and that kind of thing. I don't think two layers of fear two was necessarily better. It was longer for sure, but yeah, they honestly, if you're not a huge fan of jump scares, neither one of those games is going to be something that you're going to love. Okay, interesting. Too. Now, look, I, I'm going to have to ask this as well because this fascinates me. Any type of content creator, when you, you put your ideas down on the paper or the YouTube or wherever they're going, you know, and then you get older, you have this wonderful thing called hindsight that kicks in. Uh, is, there, is there any game that you've changed your perspective on over time? You, you, you reviewed or you played and, and now you've come back at, to it, you know, years later or months later or whatever the time period be and change your mind completely on it? Or do you find that has not happened? Uh, for me, usually it doesn't happen drastically. Honestly, I usually end up finding myself, if it's like a game, I, I, if I had to redo reviews, I would find myself probably giving games lower scores than necessarily re-reviewing it and giving it a higher. Like, I feel like I would be even more critical of it a second time around than I would the first time be like, eh, you know, that does have these kind of flaws, or maybe it didn't have quite as much content as I thought, or, you know, that kind of thing. I second guess myself way, way too much sometimes to even kind of think uh, necessarily uh, about it. I don't think, uh, one thing I try to always do with my reviews, and there's only one review I regret ever putting out, and it's still out, and I just left it because whatever. Um, but my Seven Days to Die video, I don't do a great job of explaining the game because at launch when it came out, it was so broken, I could not play the game. I had gone back later on and tried to play it, and it was more playable, but definitely not my kind of game. And had it not been by the encouragement of my girlfriend at the time, I probably wouldn't have actually put that review necessarily out. But I thought it was a good PSA at the point at that point because of how broken it was at launch on the PlayStation 4. But yeah, that's about it. I Very rarely would I say there's a game that I'm like, oh yeah, that definitely deserved much higher or much lower than what I ended up giving it. So, I, I, and I've said several times, you review like everything so are there any genres that you think you're not i shouldn't really say equipped that you don't you don't feel like you have a good basis of knowledge to be like this is a good example of this kind of game or not a good example of this kind of game or anything you you say you know this isn't really for me i'm not gonna i'm not gonna review it whether it's because you have nothing to draw on from like your retro because i think a lot of it comes from well you've been playing your whole life so you're like i know what a good metroidvania can be i know what a good you know platformer can be you've got this as opposed to someone who comes in from this generation and doesn't have that kind of knowledge to draw on do you know what i mean oh totally with the genres um uh, there's a couple of ones that i'm not as great with i'm trying to think of an example of uh, realistic driving simulators are not my cup of tea I just not really into I'm not really a huge car person. I love classic cars. Mm -hmm. So if it's anything pre seventy, I'm into it and know about it, but it's anything after nineteen seventy, I just don't really have much knowledge if and don't have a lot of interest in it. So I wouldn't I can review a game based on how well it would play and how well it would drive, but if they're looking for how well does this car control compared to its real life counterpart, I have no idea. You know, that kind of deal. Also, I'm I'm just so over the survival, open-world, procedurally generated games, I never want to play another one the long as long as I live mm -hmm. uh, because they're almost all the same. They have the same basic mechanics, and they released about 100 of them in the span of a year, and I ended up reviewing a bunch. But I just got to the point where I'm like, I see that's a game that's coming out, that kind of genre's coming out. Unless I know that it's going to be a huge release and that it's actually maybe something that I would enjoy – I'm not going after that genre anymore. Like, it's just something I don't do. I can look at, thankfully, what we talked about earlier, the drop every week for PlayStation and get an idea of what's coming out. And before, when I first started, I wasn't getting that many codes. So I would email every single company, every single game that came out every week. I was just hitting them up, seeing if I could get it. And now I'm much more picky. I have certain companies that instantly, I don't even have to ask. They just send me their codes every week or, you know, when they release a new thing. And I can decide better. I'm like, okay, I look at the list of games. I'm like, okay, this one looks interesting. This one does. But now none of these, I don't really need to focus on them. Do you just review everything that comes out? Or is it a matter of, well, I know there's going to be 20 other channels talking about this one. So I try to avoid that. Yeah, I try to avoid the ones. If I, what I agree, it's easy to do enough to search the term, whatever game review in the YouTube. And then I see what's coming, what's out. Because there are some games that came out on PC even three, four years ago that are now being ported to PS4, and they may have reviews from five, six years ago or you know four years ago. They may not. So I search, and if it's a lot of them already out there, there's no really point in me putting my word in. But if I find the game's coming out for PS4 next week, it's been out for four years, but there's no reviews, well, that, that's gold, potential goldmine at least to get mm -hmm. my you know some views on it. But at the same time, you, you seem to review every 
Um, like, uh, not well, everything. Yeah, There's a lot I miss. No, I was going to say, like, every, like, rad like a game that's come out. And I'm, I'm guessing it's because these are the people yeah. who send you codes. So you... I, I, yeah, not, not, I fully, they send me, without asking every week, uh, they send me their game. I, it's just kind of become commonplace that I'm just, every, I talk to my wife about it. She just kind of knows, like I say, it's that company again. Cause I'll get like an easy platinum in like two seconds. And you're like, what would you just do? And you got a platinum already. I'm like, it's that company again. <laughs> I like their game. The fun thing is their the games are usually fun, more often fun than not, you know? So at least there's that with the easy platinums. Now, uh, last week we had Mock on, and he was talking about how his girlfriend would help him with with the YouTube channel. Does your does your uh, does your wife help at all, or is it just one man show? No, it's pretty much one man show. It's kind of my thing to do and what I do separate. I mean, she's there. I, we I play games like uh, we have two televisions set up in the living room, so I have one television and I'm playing on, and then we're watching television sometimes on the other one. So I work sometimes eight, twelve, fourteen hours in a day, depending upon what I need to get done that week. So it's just kind of like she's so used to it existing, yet doesn't participate in it. It's kind of like we work around one another. We both work at home, and yet it seemingly so far works in a very cramped space. <laughs> That's perfect, yeah. So look, with that in mind, would you like to throw out or could you throw out any tips for sort of people that are, you know, dabbling in reviews or just sort of thinking about having a go and starting? Anything with YouTube, my, I've done a few panels even at con- conventions on kind of getting into YouTube. The biggest and easiest way to help your channel out is number one, consistency, and then learning tags. The tag system is essential, and very few channels, especially ones that are just starting out, do I notice are tagging their videos properly right from the get-go. Uh, I've had several people come to me over years and ask, hey, can you look at my channel? I don't know why I'm doing wrong, whatever it may be. And sometimes they actually are decent content. They just were tagging things completely wrong and thus not getting any viewership. So I say number one thing when you're starting YouTube and doing videos, tag your videos and, and descriptions, titles, all that kind of stuff. That is more important than necessarily you may think right away. Interesting. Interesting. Anything other than and tagging? Um, the biggest thing also is not it's not getting discouraged is my big thing. It's it's almost impossible not to be discouraged when you put hours of effort into a video and put it up and then no one watches it i was producing other a little bit of extra content that wasn't the reviews and wasn't my play it throughs i was doing a couple of retro reviews uh where i was like on camera and i was trying to do you know there's more popular youtuber video type review things i did one for crash bandicoot and another one for uh some PC Star Wars game, but they were passion projects that I loved doing, but they just didn't amount to anything. And I got discouraged even. I remember, I remember you had a, you had a really short one. It was like, a, like you made, you made drinks based on games, something like that. Ah, yes. Bar geeks, um, which I loved doing that show. It's just, unfortunately, sometimes when you involve your, here's another thing with YouTube and just videos in general, have the idea for your channel, your vision for your brand, and you stick to your vision and your brand. You don't, not that you don't take influence and you don't take advice and all that kind of stuff. I think only a stupid person doesn't take advice. But at the same time, you can't, you, you have to know what knowledge and what advice to actually take and don't let your friends eat up your creativity and take it over for themselves which is what happened unfortunately with the bar geek show it just was too many people with their hands in the pot thinking that it was doing well when i'm the one who's making all the videos and actually putting it together and stuff and we're not doing any views and i it was frustrating it just eventually fell apart if i did it over again it would be so different <laughs> if, if i ever did it again. that hindsight again yeah hindsight oh because i i love the idea of like I love uh like geek drinks and I will Same. actually order them in bars. I won't call them by their name, but like uh what's that what's that guy's name? He's he's like a professional bartender and he's a gamer and it's like the drunken drunken moogle or something like that. Well that's I know the website. There used to be always that was actually the inspiration was that website, that blog. The Drunken Moogle site was the one that we first started seeing, and we did yeah, the yeah. charity marathons. And anytime we did a charity marathon, we would see if Drunken Moogle had like a themed drink to go along with our marathon, and then we would make it, and everybody would drink it at the marathon, and we encourage people at home to you know do it as well if they had the stuff. So we had like EV challenge and that kind of thing. But yeah, that was like the inspiration behind it, and I love the idea too. It just it wasn't the vision. It never came to be the vision that I had. It it just was kind of like a vision, <laughs> you know. It wasn't what it was meant to be. Now I've got a uh, few questions to you that have nothing to do with reviews. This one. Uh, you mentioned it, I believe, at the top of the show. Like you're really into wrestling. Do you have like a separate channel that covers that, or is that just a personal hobby? Or 
it's um it's a personal hobby i love there's i have like a couple of loves in my life video games and pro wrestling are probably the two top um i've just been a fan my whole life uh, i've i've dabbled in it i actually was training just a few months ago in it again but unfortunately I, I worked as an emt for four years on a bariatric unit and i have bulging discs in my lower back that are just too bad i don't know what Ooh. else i don't know what to do at this point i need to get to mris and that kind of stuff but i'm very even though i was an emt i don't like hospitals um so anyway uh i just the physical activity i just can't do as much as i want to but working out and everything else i'm still doing um but yeah no i just i love wrestling i did a wrestle theme review where we reviewed wrestle themes for a little while uh but that kind of also was involving other people and they kind of someone one of them lost interest along with the other person kind of once again taking over and making it theirs instead of of knowing how to make it work on YouTube. But I, I just want to definitely one of my favorite things to talk about and all. And then I do my, my at least my last question uh, is you used to, maybe you still do. Are you still active in the speedrun community? I know that was something you were working on for a while. I still do, but I do it more in private than anything else. Like whenever I get a new time that I'm working, I've actually, there's several kind of secret speedrun games I've been working on and off on for a few years now at this point uh like more meteor ones that i actually want to legit try to go after records but i i uh, it's funny i am very easy to talk i'm uh, i have no problem talking in front of people or talking to people but having people watch me do something is such a different thing so i found myself in my speed runs i actually i do I do very much, I, I do better without having an audience uh, doing them on the live stream. So it's something I still like doing, but like the community wasn't anything that it wasn't something that I ended up being a big part of it, And it started to kind of go past me, some of the community and stuff. And there was a few things about it that I kind of got soured on. I still love it. I still like reviewing speed runs and watching them, but I just don't do it. I just don't have the time even as much as I like to. Do you hold any records right now as of the oh, yeah. of the um, podcast? Yeah, I still have a bunch. Um, give me one second. Actually, I'll pull up my speedrun.com oh. <laughs> profile. I, I just love how you casually throw that out there. Of course, a few, yes. Yeah, you know, well, I, 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 mean, um, I mean, give us a few times. No big deal. It's whatever. <laughs> yeah. I have some speed records as well. The world's shortest amount of time played in a game, I think. <laughs> I'm not sure they track that anymore, though. Sometimes it even makes it past the title screen, and we're very proud. Of that. Look, I know. Sometimes I don't even load the list up. <laughs> I still have the uh, world record in Captain Novelin for the Super Nintendo, the diabetic superhero game. Uh, I am oh, wow. still number one in the Itchy and Scratchy game for the Super Nintendo uh, I'm still number one in Doug's big game for the Game Boy Color. Now, that's that's a burner right there. That's a game everyone... No, no, I'm just kidding. I am also uh, number one in the only game that really matters to me as far as speedrunning goes, and that's a game called Eight Eyes. Uh, it's kind of like the game I'm known for. I have the world record for hardest difficulty and the any percent normal run or whatever. Oh, that's the that's the um, that's that Castlevania knockoff. Yes, with the, that's with that Castlevania Falcon, knockoff right? with Falcon. Yep, exactly. Uh, it's kind of one of those games I had growing up as a kid, and I loved it, even though it was terrible. Like I know it's a bad game, and it was like when I um, first started getting into speed run, I thought somebody had a record for that game. And at the time when I first set my original run, which is on Speed Demos Archive, it was not even on Twitch or anything. Um, I was the first one to even speed run it, and then it kind of I got into a little bit of um, a competitive thing with another speed runner. Uh, named Fiesel, who was a very popular, very famous speedrunner, had lots of, lots of records, and overall better speedrunner than me. I just was able to squeak out the run in that, and then he didn't go back to it. I'm sure if he wanted to, he could probably end up taking it back. Not that I won't try to get it back, though. <laughs> are, there any, um, are there any games that you'll go for the speedrun for that, that have a massive community of people going for them, like, uh, like you know, Donkey Kong? Like, uh, you know, especially since King of Kong came out, like everyone's trying that one. I, yeah, I love speedrunning Zelda 2. Zelda 2 is one of my favorite games ever, even though it's such an oddball, weird game. And I can do it in under an hour now, um, but I'm still not anywhere near what the world records are in like the any percent and then the 100% all keys run and stuff like that. Uh, I just prefer 100% non all keys. <laughs> Get all the items, all the hearts, all that stuff, but getting every key in Zelda 2 just adds so much extra frustration. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of a, probably the most popular I like. You could warm, what's it called? Uh, what's the knockoff? Battle of Olympus? Is Battle of Olympus. I love that game. Great game. That's the Zelda um, 2 knockoff, right? Yes, very much so. And interestingly enough, they were released at about the same time in Japan. Exactly. So 
Yeah, it wasn't like maybe they saw what Seta, I think Seta, um, not Seta, I can't remember who made uh, Battle of Olympus off the top of my head. They may have seen what Zelda 2 was going to be, but uh, yeah, I checked it out and like interesting enough date wise, they're like right near one another. So it's kind of fascinating that both games have almost identical gameplay in a lot of ways, but uh, were released almost at the same time. CJ, we're going to have to do a couple of retro games uh, episodes because um, I miss talking retro games with people. I clearly missed it more than I thought I did. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea you were a speedrunner as well. So look, you know, in a few months' time when you've recovered from this experience, perhaps we'll have to book you for a, a speedrunning episode because I, I don't know anything about that, but I would be fascinated to learn. So uh, that that would be good, yeah. No, I very much would enjoy talking about it. I've done several uh, conventions and panels on it. I, I love the art of it. Like yeah. The, the actual thing of speed running yeah. i love yeah that's fantastic yeah. good good well mindy if, if there's nothing else we might we might shuffle across to the next i think people are getting tired of my voice so let's uh yeah, no, not at all it's it's interesting yeah just before we hit the spam of the week i thought we'd bring back folly's corner again we started off last week i hope you enjoyed it so this week we'll see what he's uh he's got in store for us but just before we do i just wanted to throw out because i only read this this morning which is fantastic news because i know he's been trying for a little while to to set this up i'm not exactly sure how this happens but i know it's a it's an achievement so it's a good thing he's become an affiliate on twitch so that that's fantastic news to him congratulations and good luck on the next step whatever that is with your with your own content creation but i'm looking forward to hearing about Hey everyone, Afraid of the Folly back with my mum's favourite part of the podcast, Folly's Corner. I should say that that name is just a placeholder until one of us can think of something better. I haven't had a chance to stream any more They Are Billions this week, instead opting for the recently released Streets of Rogue, developed by Matt Dabrowski and published by Tiny Build. So, what is Streets of Rogue? Well, this game is what we would call a rogue light style of game. That's L-I-T-E. Now, I'm sure some of you will 100% understand what I mean when I say a rogue light, but there may be certain listeners or even certain hosts of this podcast who've heard the term but have never really known what it means or where it comes from. So let's take a minute to talk about that. Firstly, let's look at rogue-like games. That's L-I-K-E. You can normally identify a rogue-like game from its procedurally generated levels that offer a different layout each time you play. They also have a permadeath mechanic, so once the difficulty ramps up and you get out of your depth, it's a game over for you and back to the start to try again. Typically, these styles of games can be very difficult because the only way to progress further in the game is with a better understanding of the mechanics underpinning it, and a level of knowledge that can only be gained by seeing that game over screen over and over and over again, and learning each time you do so. The name itself is derived from a game called Rogue, which released back in 1980, and while it isn't known as being the first game of this style to exist, it gained enough popularity to coin this phrase that we still use today. Now, where a Rogue light separates itself from a Rogue like is in the way it handles that permadeath mechanic. While going through the procedurally generated levels, should you get overcome by whatever beasties inhabit your game of choice, you will still have to begin the game again. However, you will be allowed to carry over something from your previous playthrough, be that abilities, upgrades, or maybe even equipment. So for that reason, the light version of these rogue star games are less punishing to the player as the most of the deaths will see your character have something new to help them triumph next time. But that's enough of a history lesson. What's going on in Streets of Rogue? Well, you find yourself controlling one of the many members of the Resistance trying to overthrow a corrupt and tyrannical mayor in your home city. You must work your way through six levels of this city, each level consisting of three floors. On the first two floors, you must complete missions to unlock the elevator to go up to the next floor, with the third floor then functioning as a boss level. Now, I don't want to give too much away here, because the majority of the joy I got from Streets of Rogue was how often it surprised me with the things that you could do in each level. There are several tricks and gameplay mechanics which mean tackling the admittedly repetitious missions of kill him or steal this can be tackled in a variety of ways with an eclectic mix of characters, each with their own set of attributes and traits which means each character genuinely feels different to play. The game doesn't take itself too seriously either, as well as some characters who are somewhat based in reality, such as the gang member or a soldier. You can also play as an escaped test monkey who can rescue and recruit other monkeys to their cause, or maybe the shapeshifter who can possess any NPC in the game and then use their special abilities to your advantage. So, how do Streets of Rogue stack up as a trophy experience? Well, the trophy list doesn't look too tough, the 48 trophies mostly consisting of unlocking characters and completing levels, with some additional situational trophies that seem fun, and nothing that seems too grindy or repetitious. The game can be tough, and my personal best is only getting to the second level of the city so far. However, using the in-game currency of Chicken Nuggets, you can purchase upgrades after each run to make each subsequent run easier, and also, the game has some optional mutators which function as cheats and I've been told do not disable trophies, 
although I haven't played around with these yet. That being said, the levels are procedurally generated, so there may be elements of RNG to allow certain scenarios to occur to get these trophies to pop, so a run of bad luck could see you replaying some of these levels multiple times to get the right conditions. Currently, at time of recording, there is only one Platinum Achiever on PSN Profiles, but I'm sure once people discover the secrets of this game and a guide goes up, there'll be plenty of strategies for getting that Platinum. So, should you play Streets of Rogue? Well, in my opinion, it's a resounding yes. This game is crazy, fun and over the top. It feels like a huge toy box to play around and mess with, and with the addition of mutators, it isn't a game that just wants you to play by its rules. It's happy to put you in the driving seat and let you play the way you want to. If you still aren't convinced, I'm going to be streaming this game for a few weeks yet, so why not come over to www.twitch.tv forward slash afraid of the folly, hit follow and enable notifications and stop by to see how this game plays, and ask me any questions you may have. You can also follow me on Twitter at afraid of the folly to see when I'm going live. Now, I'll hand you back to CJ and Mindy, enjoy the rest of the podcast, and I'll catch you next week with my review of Crossing Souls. So thanks for that, Folly. That sounds like another incredibly tough game. Perhaps we'll drop into the stream and uh, and see a little bit of the content from you this week. So shuffling across to Spab of the Week, listeners, if you've made it this far, congratulations. You should feel accomplished. We feel accomplished. What can we find for you? We made it through another podcast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what can we find for you? Obviously, last week was ridiculous. There was something like 12 Spam game plats you could get across the different region stacks. What can we find for this week? Can anyone see anything did we talk mochi mochi boy last time no now i didn't want to say that because i wasn't sure how to pronounce it it's mochi mochi is that correct i think so is that how you say it that's how, that's how i said it yeah that's how i said it easy plat uh tower of beatrice is coming out like in the next week or so that's a very easy platinum i just got it like finished it up yesterday and these are the these are the rack games of the past two weeks correct yeah uh mochi mochi boy was but not uh tower of beatrice is not that's a sometimes you game oh okay so it's not cross by that's the difference is that at least at least Radalika puts out these these easy plat games and then they give you both yeah. versions. Sometimes you is like, no, we'll take five or ten dollars for each version. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> and there are two stacks of that I see as well. I assume there'll be NA and EU for that Tower of Beatrice. And Tower of Beatrice is a puzzle is a puzzle game, right? It's a room escape game. It's it, it yeah, it's yeah, it's um yeah, one of those like for you know, uh, not hidden object, but very similar to the hidden object point and click. Really? Things. It has a terrible interface on PS4. Awful. <laughs> yeah, like, because it, it's meant for mouse clicks, and it works great on PC, I'm sure. Like, I watched a video of it on PC. Oh, that's how it's supposed to play. It's just clunky as heck, trying to select where you want to in the PS4 version. Still a very easy game, like, an hour long, but I'm, I, I haven't got my review quite done, and I'll be releasing that, like, the next day or so. Spoiler, I don't give it a very high. I don't give it a great score. <laughs> well, it, it's definitely spam. It's Excellent. not a 10. It's not a 10. <laughs> That's a spoiler. It's not a 10. It, it, it throws uh, it in there. I like that. I'm going to throw out the Smooch Summer Games. Look, I think this could be high-class spam. It potentially could be quite a quick game, of course. It, it potentially may not be. Uh, all the trophies are related to winning the event. So, you know, I mean, that could be. Oh, there are some for setting records as well, but potentially that could either be really easy or just frustratingly difficult. We will, we will wait and... And C, uh, and Etherborn. I don't know if either of you two have heard of this. Uh, it's actually pretty cool. It's it's a really cool little game. I'm still working on getting. I'm, I'm still working on that one as well uh, this week. Um, it's. I think it'll be a relatively easy platinum for people because of the way the levels are set up, and I'm sure a guide will definitely help. Uh, but there is a new game plus, I think, or whatever, so you do have to play it at least two times. And but it's it's so weird. It's kind of like a weird, like almost MC Escher type of thing. The way that you're moving, uh, you go over the environment, and it's all 3D environment at this obscured angle, and you kind of like have to really maneuver the correct way in order to get your character to those right spots to solve each puzzle. It's like giant Rubik's cubes type of things each time. Really cool looking game. It is. It is a beautiful game. It, it potentially a little frustrating, I think. As you say, I'm yes. with the guide, I think it will be very easy. And I, I think I, I haven't got very far on it yet, but I, I got a little bit annoyed yesterday. And then I sort of just, I think, random lucked my way onto the right side and managed to finish <laughs> certain levels. So yeah. I'm not sure I know exactly what I'm doing yet, but I'm getting there. So I'm enjoying it, though. It is a, it is a beautiful game. So high quality. I'm going to throw out again, uh, just because there's two stacks of Conga Master Go, I do want to reiterate, this is not to be looked at as trophy spam. Uh, about 70% of this platinum is going to be down to RNG. Um, so, you know, you could look at the sheer amount of trophies and think, oh, that's, you know, fairly straightforward. No, no, honey, no. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, if it wasn't for that stupid roulette system, it would have been fine. Like, that roulette system for unlocking characters is so unnecessary. Here's my thing. Get rid of one of these things. The roulette system or the lack of level select. Either or, it would be significantly better. I agree. You yep. know? If you if you don't have level select, then don't have a roulette system. Or if you don't have level select, then have a roulette system. If you don't have a roulette system, then you can have the lack of level select. It'd still be right. annoying. But it's just the, the combination of both of those in the game is just awful. And I'm going to preemptively, this is the last one I have to throw out, I'm going to preemptively throw Ellen onto this list. And the only reason I'm I'm preemptive is, A, it, ha- it doesn't seem to have come out yet. <laughs> the only requirement but, is required. Uh, it's a it's a pixelated it looks like a pixelated horror game honestly uh it's kind of that 8 bit like uh, it's not quite 8 bit it's not quite 16 it's like the last door oh which got patched by the way so i have to finish my walkthrough and oh, uh and put that out so if you finish back in 1995 you could you could jump across to ellen yeah but excellent you know the last door is actually good so uh <laughs> but it's kind of that like you know in between 8 and 16 bit pixelated probably a horror game it's one of those games that the trophy list is really, really obscure and doesn't actually tell you what you need to do, which either means A, it's all story related or B, you just got to puzzle it out. But once someone's puzzled it out, it's going to be really easy. All of the trophies are silver and gold, which is always a always a, a, a good indicator of trophy spam. Yes, that's very true. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll wait and see. But I'm going I'm to tentatively put it on because the list is live, but the game does not seem to have come out yeah, yet. I see. And I don't think it was on the drop, so it, do, it looks like it's one of those games that the list release, releases well before the game comes yes. out. Yeah, yeah. Which I don't think the Wolfenstein list is no. out yet, is those it? Those big games, they quite often hold. That's so, crazy. Until almost release, so that, that will probably be later this week. And look, the last one, well, I actually have two, one on the list and one not on the list. So the one on the list is Captain Cat, because if you're going to be a cat, of course you want to be a captain. And <laughs> look, this is this is your old dollar machine, hook machine, I don't know what you call those things, where you'd have the mechanical uh, you know, hook and you, you tried to win the toy or whatever. That's basically what this game is. Oh, the crane yeah, game. Yeah, that's basically what this game is. Look, it's very... Yeah, it's basically a puzzle cream. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's sort of cute. It's, you know, like 20 or 30 levels and there's four different worlds or whatever else. The trophies are all easy except for you do, in the first two uh, worlds, you do need to perfect every level. So there's three stars. So potentially it could be a few little tricky bits there. But, you know, I, I'd say it's like maybe slightly more challenging spam or whatever, but it's kind of fun just to chip away, you know, no-brainer chip away. And then the other one, which possibly the two of you have not heard about because the list has not come out yet, the game is for sale, is a game called Driving Essential which is just look it's just fantastic if you if you need to touch up on your driving skills if you need to learn how to drive and you want to do it on the playstation <laughs> this is the game for you coming in at a ridiculous 40 us dollars uh it's a series of eight or nine driving lessons or whatever else it's been on the xbox and pc for quite some time i understand uh i'm going to take a stab that it does have a plat but whatever you do don't buy it until you find out that it definitely does have trophies it does have achievements though or whatever else that are all fairly straightforward but it is a simulator you you are apparently required to look both ways at the intersection and also use the blinkers. So prepare yourself for that plat before you um you jump in. But yeah, I think that's just what we need. And needed. Corin, you you would I think maybe you would know more than us because um, you you get a lot of these in advance. Anything you've played this week that you think will qualify as spam that maybe hasn't shown up on the list yet? Well, that's what I said. The Tower of Beatrice is the only one, but I haven't played anything else that's not already on there now. Nothing this week. Sometimes, though, it's funny. Like, yeah, it takes, I'll get a game a month ahead of time. It takes weeks and weeks for it finally to get the trophy list up. But I don't understand why it takes so long sometimes. Sometimes it never goes up. But, you know, the, the, yeah. <laughs> these are the fun things that we are we get to deal with as trophy hunters. So, look, I'd like to thank Cornjack today for, for joining us. It's been a very informative episode. I've really enjoyed it. I hope you have as well, sir. I have very much. Thank you for having me on. And especially thank you for being flexible. Cornshack wasn't supposed to come on for like another month, but uh, we had an unfortunate uh, rescheduling for this week's podcast. And uh, I reached out to um, a couple of people who said they were flexible and, and it was just a bad week for everyone. And Cornshack was like, yeah, no, I can do it. I was like, oh, thank you. We're not because we're, we're trying to get one out every week. And so far, knock on wood, this is episode 21, right? And there's been an episode out every week. And I'd really like to continue that as long as possible. So thank you for going from um, I have a month to prepare to I have three days to get ready. (laughs) 
It, it, it is a challenge. And, uh, you know, I know that we do have some guests waiting in the wings here at the moment, and I do apologise. One of the challenges of running a weekly podcast, you know, between countries like this is, you know, we are at the, the, um, the hands of the internet a little bit. So there's a little bit of reshuffling perhaps in the next few weeks as well. But I thank, uh, thank the guests potentially and also the listeners for their time. So, Kornjak, where can we find you if we're looking for you? Uh, go to www.youtube.com slash Shack Gaming. It's Corn Shack Gaming is the full channel. One word, one giant word. As well as you can find me on Twitter at Corn Shack. I am on almost every social media as Corn Shack except for like Tumblr. Someone took my name on there years ago. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, other than that, yeah. Pretty much if you see Corn Shack, it's probably me. I, you know, I can't believe I never asked this at the top of the show. Why is it Corn Shack? Uh, it's uh, I get asked all the time. It's actually one of those things where you know you have you, your friends and you're hanging out really late at night, and for some reason something's really funny when you're really tired at four in the morning. And I loved uh, I love the snack food corn nuts, and I also uh, am a fan of, of Shaquille O'Neal. But like we were pl- like me and my friends were hanging out, and for some reason we started talking about Shaq Fu. And completely delirious, you know, mentally, I just go, what if we combined corn nuts and shack to make the ultimate snack food, corn shack? And like as a complete joke, and my fan, we all laughed, we like laughed our butt off for like 10 minutes for no reason. And then uh, months later, months go by, and I needed to come up with a name for YouTube. And I just was like, I just was creating an account. I wasn't going to put videos, I had no plan to make videos on YouTube. I'm like, I need a name. I haven't gone by a few other random screen names and stuff. I'm like, none of them were like, they felt, they didn't feel unique or anything. They were more like my high school or edgier emo kind of phase kind of crap. Uh, so I needed something that was like, whatever. I was like, Corn Shack. I just came back to my mind at that point. I put it as my channel thing, and I've been stuck with it ever since. That is awesome. And also, that is the first reference on this show we have to the wonderful game of Shaq Fu. That is awesome. I love Mr. Shaq Fu. Which one? The, the good one or the remake? I only played the, the, the remake. original. Good, I only played the original. The original Shaq Fu. <laughs> and it wasn't the DLC <laughs> ba- Barak Fu. <laughs> I never got to play it. Uh, you, Barack Obama, Obama right? is a playable character yeah. in, in the Shaq Fu remake. No, re, uh, no, reboot, we're, getting, we're, we're getting sidetracked listeners, but what a fantastic game. Uh, and Mindy, where can we find you? Twitter at the mind is a city. I also co-run CJ, the push to plat Twitter account. That's push number two plat. Also, I'm on the guide team at PlayStationTrophies.org. If you want to learn how to write a trophy guide, hit me up over there. I will assist you through that process. The show is available on iTunes podcasts, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, and all good podcast providers. As Mindy mentioned, we are on Twitter at push the number two fight, push two fight, or you can send us an email at push two fight at gmail.com. Just a reminder to give us a like, a subscribe, or whatever. Tell anyone you know, tell everyone you know, whether they're grinding, playing a game in the car, walking, whatever. We're happy to be uh, happy to be your company for a couple of hours a week uh, and drop some gaming knowledge if you call it on you so with that i'm going to wrap up happy trophy hunting for this week we will catch you next week thanks guys bye bye have a good one